All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 21st, 2023. Can you believe it? Where are we today? We are the 21st of June, the first day of Savan. Some might say maybe it started earlier, but you got to remember the Jews counted from here, <clears throat> right, from the 20th to here so at this point we're now starting the second day man you want to talk about exciting we are in for some exciting teaching tonight it's <laughs> it's gonna be we're gonna touch on things that a sister caught in uh two i guess three videos ago now that i was sharing about about the three dates that we were looking at we're gonna go into that but in particular, the the first one and where it ended. It was found by our sister Ruth when I said in the video it was the first one, but it really never ended anywhere. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to touch briefly on the reminder of of the two different types of wheat and, and what some of one of the wheats is used for. We're going to talk about uh, a piece that we shared from from a brother's website um, I think he's, it's the creation calendar. We don't follow or believe his creation calendar, you know, two weeks off, new moon, full moon, all that stuff. But he has some info there that we've shared in the past about 14ers. We're going we're gonna to briefly touch on that just as I'm building to make a point. Building to show and to remind you guys, go into the revelation of, of Taurus and the head of Taurus and the eye in for the right eye the Taurus representing one, the left eye representing noon. We're going to briefly touch on what noon means and how it's connected to the Father and the revelation from the Father and what this is going to lead us into. We have touched on this topic once in the past about, I'm guesstimating, maybe about a year and a half ago. And, and it, was a, it was a bit much uh for me to to absorb when you when you realize for those that have been around in the ministry for a little bit if you're new this stuff is going to go way over your head but if you've been around for a little bit or you've been around for a while you you will have probably heard uh this in the past but we're going to delve into the depths of it and i never really went fully into it before because as much as it seemed it was talking about us and me i really don't like making things about me. This has never, ever, ever been about me. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ that is happening here in this ministry and has been for the past five and a half years. So those who have been around for a while, those that have stuck it out, those that have been following and diligently seeking and being the Enoch types, are aware that it's happening. There has never been a point in, in the last 2,000 years where the Gospels have been revealed in who they're speaking to. The prophets have never been revealed in the deeper depths of the revelations that are hidden in them until this ministry. The secrets of creation that reveal the end of days and the end of days that reveal the mystery of creation has never been revealed until this ministry. You know, you guys have heard me talk in the past and and it, how like the first year and a half it was it was it was a crazy crazy time in my house. I was continuously on every couple days having like 2 hour conversations with my wife. I mean, praise my wife, man. She is so awesome. I've got such a great wife and such great kids. I I, I couldn't even even pick them out myself. I know they were given to me by the Lord because I, you've heard me say it in the past. I could never have done this if I had a, a, a disobedient, you know, really disobedient kids or, or a wife that was just flippant about faith and my faith. You know, there's no way that I could have been able to do this. And, and especially that first year and a half or so, man, two hour conversations every couple of days because I would be crying because I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I couldn't understand that this guy who never read 
the new the the Bible, you know, going to the King James and I'd be pulling my hair out because of the these thou this and and it was always difficult to read like just about all of you at one point. And now I, with my eyes closed, I can tell you the story from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation and give it all to you in prophecy through about 40 of the 60 some books with my eyes closed. <laughs> that isn't me. I don't I don't you know, do I know how it's happening? Yes, I know it's the will of the Father through the Son being led by the Holy Ghost. Well, it turns out, as we've touched on this in the past, and we're going to go into greater detail tonight, it turns out that there was somebody prophesied from a little over 2,000 years ago that would be the person to receive it. So you could see my apprehension in wanting to go into the depths of it. You can understand that. Yeah. Because, you know, it's not about me. It's not a pride thing. But you have to understand that, especially in the last, oh, I'd say it was about three weeks. I... I've been I've been really struggling. You know, when I'm teaching, I, I'm full of energy and I'm, I love it. But when it's off, I just felt this weight. And, you know, Petra, I, I had sent in, I was in conversation with Petra about a week or so ago. And my right shoulder had been killing me. Just like many of you, you're feeling the weight of these things because the time is close and the enemy is trying to weigh us and bring us down. But it's because as watchmen, we're 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 feeling the weight of these things we we're understanding that the time is close whether it starts here whether it starts here or whether it starts here the time is at hand and we're feeling this weight and i was no different my i could feel it in my shoulders and it wouldn't go away it's it was over just a little over three weeks of this and i was telling Petra about it to see if she could pray and she can ask the Lord, you know, what is going on? Because it was also weighing me and I, w I was, you know, I was feeling like I was getting depressed, right? But I I'm excited because I know what I have. This, this isn't a maybe thing. We know the revelation of the Lord, of his word has happened here. But we know it isn't completed. We know the completed work of the revelation will come when the Son of Man comes for 40 days, as we know from Luke 24. But we've been teaching here for the last several years that that verse in Luke chapter 24, I think verse 44 and 45, that that verse is when the Lord comes and will complete the revelation and the understanding. And you're going to see what I'm talking about when we get into that section tonight. Because it, it leads me in two options. I've told you guys before, I don't know if I'm a worker. I've had people tell me, well, it's obvious. And I've had people tell me that they think it would make more sense if I was the one that brought about the revelation, then I was gone as the confirmation of it. Right? Go pre-trib with everybody else going pre-trib. Well, you're going to see that this person has two possibilities and i wish it was more clear but you're going to see what i'm talking about in relation to these two possibilities but i had been pleading because my shoulder is kill was killing me the the weight i was feeling because as i said we can all sense it and we see it and we know it's in the air and we understand revelation we know we're coming to the true end of 70 years it is the final generation there's going to be 10 years and a little bit left and then the flying away that's, that's the Judah at mid-trumpets. We understand this. But the weight just kept bearing down. And I had been crying out to the Lord, you know, for, for about three weeks or so, more so than ever, as I know many of you have as well. And I'd been pleading to say, Lord, what is going on here? What is happening in this ministry? I know what's happening. I know from, from right from the beginning when I knew something was there and I pursued it, that I started to get understanding mysteries that had been hidden since the beginning. Meaning these mysteries were hidden within even the prophets. 
They were hidden within the Gospels. They were hidden within creation. All to be revealed in the final generation by somebody which appears to be me. Otherwise, these things would have been known for centuries. So, Lord, this was my plea. Lord, are we not close enough? Are we not close enough that you could finally give me more insight? Can you finally let me know what's been happening here? Because you know what? As I've told you guys dozens of times, I don't get dreams and visions. I get revelation. I, and it's not the spirit that says, here it is. I got to study. I got to be diligent. But as I read, I just understand. Sometimes it's instantly. Sometimes I got to dig deep. Excuse me. Sometimes I got to dig deeper. And, and that's what freaked me out so much in the beginning. Because in the beginning, it had to be given to me. Because, meaning I would read and then I would understand. And, and I couldn't believe how this was happening. Because I realized that these things hadn't been understood before. And so as I'm pleading with the Lord for these things, I, my shoulder had been killing me. And this was on Thursday, and all of Thursday, I, I was quiet. My wife knew there was something wrong, right? I had been slowly getting more and more quiet the entire week as things were weighing even more over this, at that point, about three weeks. And, um, and, and Thursday, I mean, she left me alone. You know, she knew it. We had a little chat, a, you know, typical husband, dad, uh, man thing, you know, uh, nothing, all, it's all good, whatever, right? And so she went and did her thing and did her crafts and stuff downstairs. And I, I didn't have my laptop. I just literally watched a hockey game and just sat there. Duh, and just I just didn't have it. And then at about 9, 10 o'clock, I open up my laptop and I start looking. And I'm still in my thoughts and, and talking with the Lord in my thoughts. And said, Lord, please, please give me something. You know, help me, help me to, to settle. I know we've got to be close enough. Can you not give me something? And bam, this person in historical documents from the Qumran, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls came back into my thoughts. And I said, what? And I decided to start digging into it again. And this time going deeper to see more of what is said about this person and what this person was doing in the final generation and what this person would receive and who he was leading as a remnant. You see? And as I started to dig, as I started to go further and deeper into it, my wife comes up, it's about 11 something at night, and I feel the weight start to lift. I hadn't been able to sleep from that beginning of that week since Sunday night. I'd been sleeping an hour and a half, two hours, waking up, my shoulder killing me, having a stretch, go back to sleep two hours later, waking up, having a stretch for, for the entire week until Thursday night. And I suddenly started to feel lighter and started to feel lighter. And I started my, the, the joy and, and the excitement of saying, all right, Lord, if I, I know what this is about, you know, if this is where you want me to go, because I didn't know what I was going to do for the next video. I thought, you know what? They could wait. You know, I was talking to Petra and Petra's like, it's okay if you go an extra day or so and take a little time for yourself. It's weighty, right? It, it, this is a lot. When you understand what's happening, it's, it's a big deal what's happening here. Well, when we read about what's written about this guy, you're going to understand even more so why. That's how crazy this is. That's how powerful this is. That's how powerful what's happening is in this ministry. And for those who receive it, they are included in this. You guys are included in this. It doesn't mean everybody's a worker. I believe some are going to go pre-trip from here and some are definitely going to be workers. You're going to see this. And so I was like, all right, Lord, if this is what you want. And I started building into it and building into it and going through the entire info. And I said, fine, I'm going to add this into the next video. And you know what happened that night? I slept like a baby 
I slept like I had normally done right through the night. I never have any issues sleeping and waking up when it's time. It, no problem. I never wake up in the middle of the night. But for the entire week I had, because it just wasn't coming, it wasn't coming, it wasn't coming, and it was getting worse. And then bam, he's like, all right, here you go. Like my heart can be at ease, meaning it's okay, Alan. You can accept it. This is a person that I've chosen. Whether it's, it's a lot to take in that it's you, it doesn't change the fact that there's only one person that's received the revelation. And then I went to bed, I woke up Friday, and my shoulder didn't hurt anymore. I slept through the night. And then I started digging more on Friday and yesterday into Saturday. And oh my goodness. It's awesome. And you know what I think it is? I think what's going on is the Lord is saving it right for the tail end. Why? Because we're here. Whether, like I said, here, whether here, or whether in here, it all begins in Taurus. And it will be this year of 2023. Is that a thus saith the Lord? No. You see, if you remember... All the way back in the beginning, I used to tell you guys just a few months into it, that when this started happening to me, and I just understood as I was reading the prophetic of the is to come hidden within these things, I said, and I always kicked myself for saying this, I said to myself in prayer to the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, I said, if you would just continue to do this for me, because I didn't know what the next teaching was going to be. And then the next teaching, and then the next teaching, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know how much longer we have doing this. How am I going to continue to keep showing more revelation? Your word is infinite, but how am I going to keep going? You're going to have to keep making these revelations and keep guiding me and leading me in them by the Spirit. And if you do that, this is what I said, then I'm fine if you don't give me dreams or visions because you're giving me the revelation in the understanding of the word, which myself, and I know many, many, many others like you out there, would much rather have it through the word so that we can understand it, follow it, seek it, and understand for ourselves that it's true. Dreams and visions, everybody like because it's easy, but they don't really know if it's true or not unless they can be substantiated by scripture because scripture is the source so that was why i said that and then over the years i've kicked myself thinking oh man you know i would have loved to have had dreams and visions along the way lord but i accept that if it's just through revelation and your will through the revelation of jesus from the beginning to the end in these mysteries by the power of your spirit then so be it i'm in and I'll keep doing it week in, week out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, until it's time. Wait till you see what's written about this person. It's going to blow your mind. And you know what's crazy about it? Like I said, it's not just me. I, there it has to be a source, just as there was with, with, with Moses, just as there was with Abraham, just as there was with, with Noah, just as there was with Paul. Just there, there always has to be one source. You give it to everybody, and everybody has their own little take. No, it goes through one. And it used to baffle me that these mysteries that we've been seeking for centuries, that all the thousands and tens of thousands that we've tried to share with throughout the entirety of this ministry that myself and you guys have tried to share with, very few are receptive to hear it. Because that first remnant worker group is not big. Wait till you see it, guys. It, it, it seems over the top. But if you've been here for any amount of time, <laughs> you know it's true. You guys are going to see it for yourselves. And you're going to understand <clears throat> that, that this person 
who was in the was right before in about the 100 BC before Christ, you're going to see that if, if he was the final one and that there wasn't this, this um, counterpart in the final generation, then all of these things that have been revealed here in this ministry, in particular with the prophets, but other places as well in the law, right? <coughs> that, that they would have already been known. This entire conversation about this person of one who was written about in the past, he was one who was there. But there is also a future one who is called his counterpart, who is the one who will be the one to receive these revelations. Because had he, had he been the one, as I said, then all of the revelations would have been understood for 2,000 years. Nobody would have been confused about the end of days and, and how it pertains and what's the deeper underlayer of the prophets that even the prophets themselves didn't know. You see, you're going to see that the prophets of old had dreams and visions. This one isn't a prophet, but he's in the category of prophet, but he's not as the other prophets because he doesn't have dreams and visions. He has the revelation of understanding. It's, it's insane. It is so over the top, guys. It, it's incredible. So as, as this progresses and as we get to there, you guys are going to see it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow your minds. And what I want to do now, I want to remind you guys, you see, we're not gone yet. We don't, we don't know with 100% certainty when we're going. Oh, I believe with the absolute completeness of my spirit to the best I can through revelation that we have proven out with the 70th year that this is indeed it. We've proven it out with, with this incredible chart that we have here, which is the Shemitah year or the Sabbath year charts all the way back to the birth of Christ. It's, it's incredible what this chart right here reveals. Every single piece in order. But we're still not there yet. And this is why I bring it up. Because as you're going to see in a little piece that I'm going to share with you in a little bit, this remnant group in the is to come, when the pre-trib escape happens, the, the, the seven-day wedding happens of the Gentile bride, and the Lord returns on the eighth day to be here as the Son of Man for 40 days. From that point forward, it doesn't matter if you think you had prosperity, right? And I'm not talking about prosperity gospel or any of that garbage. I'm saying it doesn't even matter if you're wealthy now or well-to-do now. One, you ain't taking it with you. And two, you won't even have it during the end of days if you are one of the remnant workers. It's going to be given away. It's going to be sold and given or it'll be taken. Because this remnant end time worker group, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, this group is going to be going, being sent all over the place throughout the earth, preaching and teaching. You see? You're not taking anything with you. And so this is my plea. This is why I'm bringing this up right now. Because the ministry and in particular, the ministry in Uganda needs the support right now. You see, our brother Steve in Uganda has, coming up in June, he still needs another 150 or 120 books because they want to learn end time prophecy to the churches he's going to. But on top of that, in June, now remember, we don't know if we're for sure going at the end of May or by mid-June. He has a gathering of pastors and church leaders, four to 500 of them, that have requested him to come and his team to teach on the revelation of the end of days. You see, they've got their Bibles. They have their provisions. Now they want the understanding. And Steve had let me know about this. And because they had spent the money on recent books, he didn't even have money for food this coming, this past Friday. 
Well, guess what? I had $78 in my account. I couldn't even send him a couple hundred bucks right away, right? We can do the transfer and he receives it right away to his phone. I couldn't even send him money to get food. You see, am I, do, am I saying this because I'm whining and complaining? No, I want to do everything we can to get as many, as many books, as many Bibles, reach as many and prepare as many as we can in the Revelation before it all begins. He might have those books printed and not even go to that appointment because everything will have begun. But guess what? Those books will still be available. Do you know why the ministry revealed book is going to be important? You'll see. <coughs> You're going to see. Will the disciples that are going to work, that remnant disciple portion, are they going to know in, the, in this time to come? Are they going to be given the complete finality of what's been taught here? Yes, they are. The Lord is going to give it to them. But what about those who aren't reached by them right away? What if they had the book? When the disciples finally show up in those regions of the world? Do you think maybe those people that will have had the books or read it and those that were left behind and others can pick up those books and read them? You're darn right they can. And this is what I want to do. I want to have the greatest amount of support come in that we can for anybody and everybody listening. Am, am I disappointed that more don't? No. You know what happened? I couldn't send Steve food uh, money for food, so I had to ask my wife. My wife had a couple hundred bucks that she could transfer me. So my wife transferred me a couple hundred bucks, and I sent it all to Steve. Why? Because I told Steve I will do everything I can to support him, everything I can to grow and bless his ministry so that he can expand it get out more Bibles, reach more people with the truth of the word, and then teach them the revelation in preparing them for the time to come. That they would either be ready for pre-trib, or if they're here to remain, they would be prepared with understanding. You see that? But you know what? I need you guys. I need you guys. That's all there is to it, right? <laughs> I don't have anything left. I got 60-something bucks in my account now. So I need you guys. And so I'm hoping this will reach some of you. Now, I'm not talking to those who can't. I'm talking about those who can. I know that everybody who has the ability or doesn't have the ability, that we are all praying over each other, that we are all lifting each other up, strengthening each other. But for those who can, we have a PayPal button right here on the YouTube channel and a GoFundMe link right here on the YouTube channel. In the description box under the video, there is also the PayPal link and the GoFundMe link. On the ministryrevealed.com website, there is the PayPal link and the GoFundMe link. So if you are led, if you would love to help support that and get that out, especially after you're going to see what you're going to witness tonight, then please, whatever you can, do, because this is the end. The time is at hand. You see, guys? If you remember this, excuse me, a little sip of my coffee. Guys, if you remember this, this, this story about the cross, right? The whole story about the 717. You guys recall that? I'm leading you into this first, first part per, first to talk about this video here that was, okay, I'm doing one now, and then there was this one, and then this one. So the, I think it was like the first 52 minutes or so of the bold judgments where we were talking about how we were talking about how from this count here as the beginning of the 50 days, this as the true seventh Sabbath, if that indeed is the seventh Sabbath, and this begins the 50 days, that when the 50 days ends, I was saying, you see, it, it doesn't really end on anything. What's the 28th of Tammuz? You know, there, there's really no connection to this. Well, when we counted from this as the seventh Sabbath and this as the beginning of the 50, excuse me, as the beginning of the 50, it started on a significant day, June 5th, right? The short attack that we know comes first before the Son of Man shows up. And we know that at the end of the 50 days, it's the seventh of Av, <coughs> right? Seventh of Av goes from here 
And the seventh of Av was the beginning of the attack, of the attack that destroyed Jerusalem and when they're going to re be removed from the land and the 14 years begin. So this one seemed to line up a lot better. <clears throat> well, it turned out that there was potentially something connected to this, to this count as well. And I'm going to lead you into it first. Remember what we talked about with Jesus on the cross? Jesus, well, I mean, why was Jesus the middle one? He could have been the right one. He could have been the left one. Why was he the middle one? Because one of the depictions of this is Jesus is the beginning, right? This is almost like the head of Taurus. It's almost like the, the right eye, Ayin, the left eye. You see, it's almost like it's Taurus. He's representing the beginning. And the beginning in creation, as you guys remember, was Taurus. Taurus was the beginning, and the beginning was the feast of first fruits of the wheat harvest. That uh, was the feast of first fruits, right? <clears throat> and this is what he was representing, the beginning. We know this because on Jesus' right to our left, he told this guy, that guy, right, he, he, he essentially... In, in a roundabout way, you could say, he asked for forgiveness, he accepted who the Lord was, and the Lord said that he would be with them in paradise. That's what this picture is. So what do you have? You have the pre as the middle, you have the mid as the great multitude rapture that goes to paradise, and then you have the post as the other one. You see, what was this a picture of? Well, it was the picture of 2 Corinthians, right? Chapter 12. I, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Where's the third, first one go? First one goes to the third heaven. This is the pre-trib growing up like a rapture. So it's not the rapture, but it's going to be like a rapture. And it's the 10% of the wheat that goes first. <clears throat> the second one is the was caught up. This is the rapture. They're the ones that go to paradise. And we know, of course, the third one is when the Lord is coming. This is all typology in what Paul was doing here. You see, it's the revelation within the stories. And this is what people have a hard time seeing. It's the revelation. It's the mysteries hidden within the stories. And what do we see? This is the third time when he's what? Now he's coming to them. So what do we have? A taking, a taking, and a return. That's, that's going to be part of this as well. What do we know these first two are? The third heaven and paradise, <coughs> excuse me, are part of the kingdom of God, okay? The kingdom of heaven <clears throat> is their promised millennial reign, is the heaven on earth. So the Luke group go pre-trib to the third heaven. The Mark group go mid-trib, right? In the seventh year of seals, go mid-trib to paradise. And in the, at the end of the seventh year of trumpets, the Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, and they're going to come back, and they're going to have their millennial reign, which is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so what do you have? Well, this represents the one. This represents the, the cross, Christ on the middle cross. Like the Feast of Weeks typology. Paradise is the representation of the seven <coughs> years of seals for the seven days of unleavened bread, which represents when they go connected to the Passover in, in the following, in the seventh year of seals. And the third one, is connected to when the Lord returns, which is the seven years as days, which represent the seven days as years of tabernacles. <clears throat> Again, something we've covered, right? Here it is right here. It's the three feasts of the Lord. So these are the three feasts that belong to the Father. You see, seven days of the bread of affliction, which is unleavened bread. One day for the feast of weeks and another seven days for tabernacles. The answer is what? Seven, one, seven. Okay? It's seven, one, seven, but to the Lord God, it all begins what? In the beginning. The Feast of Weeks is the beginning. All right? Remember this, <clears throat> even with the Apocrypha, when we showed, right? It says, um, those who are deemed worthy, <clears throat> excuse me, of an abode in heaven will go there. Others, the delights of paradise, and others the, the, will possess the splendor of the city. And, the, and somehow, the Lord will be in all three, <clears throat> right? 
It goes in and explains it more here. This is the apocryphal fragments from the church fathers. You know what's awesome about that? The Essenes, which is from the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are the Essenes that wrote these things. Their belief and their following, because it was before Christ was here, was from the church fathers. They were the ones that were regarded. They were the ones that had prophecy understood in their days. To the coming of Christ, his death and resurrection time frame. They were the ones that people turned to. It's like our brother uh, Roy had said to me about a year or so ago, that he believes after having studied some of the Essenes, that here in this ministry, a group set apart, just like the Essenes did, they separated from Jerusalem and they were their own group outside of Jerusalem. Because with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there was too much corruption of, of, of scripture and corruption of, of different ways. These guys stuck to the scriptures of the ancients with the church fathers. It's amazing. The patriarchs, right? It's awesome stuff. And, and it's, it's, there's similarities to what's happening here. And just like the Essenes, there was somebody in the early beginning of the Essenes who headed it, who started this, this group outside of the church, outside of Israel. You see, back then, <clears throat> they were a priestly line through, from Jerusalem. Well, we're in the day and age of Israel. The house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. We're talking about a group, not locally anymore, but now it's expanded throughout the entire earth. And here we are online through a community, a community established where like-minded brothers and sisters are seeing and understanding the revelations whether they're understanding it a little bit in part and trying to grow and are growing in it, or have understood it and are going deeper and deeper, <clears throat> whereas thousands and tens of thousands of others refuse to look at it or can't see it when it's shown to them. It's the exact same story as it was with the Essenes. But we're on the other side of it. We're on the Christian side. We're on the, the Gentile grafted in house of Israel side of things. Well, they have a priestly line too. And we know this priestly line is going to be a part of that remnant worker. You see? Well, so again, what do we have? You have seven days, one day, seven, uh, seven days. Okay? The three feasts of the Lord. <clears throat> but it all begins with the Feast of Weeks, kind of like his picture, you see? There he was, the middle on the cross, representing the beginning. Paradise, and then this would be when he returns. That's the picture we have. You know what else it's like? It's like the Father's name. Isn't that crazy, right? Yahuwah, yod He vav He. okay? yod He vav He. okay? So this is Vav, or sorry, Yod, hey, this is hey right here. So what does it look like? So you have yod, hey, vav, hey. But to us, we know that there's a revelation of 717. In fact, even in the scriptures in the Hebrew, 717 in the Hebrew is used twice. One means to pluck, the other is to gather. <laughs> right? One is to pluck, the other is to gather. And the Lord's name looks like what? Well, the Lord goes from right to left. So it looks like seven comma one seven. And what do we see it looks like? It looks like the seven, this from left to right, it looks like the seven and the one are together. And it's a comma and the seven here is by itself. Well, what does it look like? It looks like those who are going to the kingdom of God. The third heaven and paradise are part of the kingdom of God. This one is connected to the Feast of Weeks, the one. This one is connected to the seven, which is paradise. And this one is connected to the seven, which is tabernacles, which is the kingdom of heaven when the Lord returns. So in the Lord's name, you have the beginning. See, it's like there's the seven, but there's a comma separating. Begins here, then the seven of Passover, 
and then it's the final seven for Judah. Isn't that cool how that works? You want to know why that's cool? And why I'm, I'm leading you into this like I said I was doing? is because I want you to see this. This is what our, six, our sister Ruth caught in the video. So if this truly is the seventh Sabbath, then that makes this the beginning of the 50 days, the start of the 50 day count. <clears throat> With this being the start of the 50 days, guess where it ends? On the 28th of Tammuz. And in the video, I had said that equaled nothing. Well, don't forget, we are on the world side of things right now. We are in the Gregorian Gentile age right now. Do you know what it equals on the Gentile calendar? <clears throat> Just like this count here, this one. So if it isn't this next week, then it's the week after. And this begins the 50. On the Gentile calendar, what is it? It's June 5th. Well, in 1967, June 5th to June 10th was the short-lived uh, Middle Eastern War. What do we know starts the 50 days? A short-lived Middle Eastern War in Israel with Iran and the proxies with them in, in two major cities in northern Israel will be destroyed, Haifa and Tel Aviv. Right? And when it's over and it's the 7th of Av, we know historically in the was that the 7th of Av to the 9th, the 7th of Av began the destruction of Jerusalem which we know at the end of 50 days is the destruction of Jerusalem. But if this is it next week and it's the ninth of Av, and I was saying that this doesn't equal anything, well, check it out. If the, Jew, if the Gregorian calendar is something and we're in the time of the Gregorian, what number is July? Seven. What date? The 17th. The 50 days would end on 7, 1, 7. 7, 17. The 50 days ends and the 14 years begins. That's a cool little side note, isn't it? So thank you, Ruth, for finding that. Never dawned on me for a second. Seventh month. 17th day, not the start of, of the 50 days. We're talking about the end of the 50 days and the beginning of the 14 years in the attack on Jerusalem. But if it's not this one, we're only looking to the following week. And the worst case scenario is 10 days from this because the moon could be off for 10 days. But to understand that, go to the video on bulls and you'll understand it there in the first 52 minutes, okay? So there you go. From the 28th, add 50 days. You've got to remember, it's not counting this date. To the 17th is 50 days, all right? So a fun little side note there, that there is a connection. And again, does it, <laughs> does it confirm one of the three any better? No, but it does add something to the first one that I thought didn't have a connection at the end of 50, whereas the other two did. So it doesn't bring any more clarity as to which one, but it helps bring more insight that, hey, wait a second, it very well still could be the first one, all right? So how about this? If you guys will remember this, it was the difference between uh, spring wheat and winter wheat. We've shared on this in the past, if you recall. Let me close this out, it's continuing to spin. We, we've shared on this with the difference between spring wheat and winter wheat. So spring wheat is sown in the spring and is harvested in the fall. So it's very late summer to early fall that it's harvested. Winter wheat is sown in late fall and it lives through the winter and is harvested in late, late spring to early summer. Okay. There were two wheat harvests, even in ancient, in ancient Israel, and they have the 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 records and the facts on that as well what do we know about these two wheats well if you recall from genesis chapter 29 this is something we've shared on for a long time and we've got an excellent video we did on it right here 
Okay, this video right here. Oh, there's a lot of good videos in this portion of time. So he starts it and ends it. How fitting is that? The Lord's name starts it and ends it. Now remember, the Lord's name. Okay, yod heh vav, yod -Heh, vav heh 717 it looks like. And all of the revelation we had and, and the feasts of the Lord are 717. To which the final one is the one for Judah and the first two are the kingdom of God to, to, the, to the world to the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. They're the first two of, of, the, of the one for Feast of Weeks and of the seven for the seven days of affliction of Passover, right? Unleavened bread. That one and that seven, they are two different wheat harvests. Hello. This is what we talk about in this video. Old before new. It truly was an absolutely incredible video. Everybody who hasn't seen this video should watch it. The revelation came through a number of sources over a period of, of growing in different areas when it came together. And when it came together, this was the revelation. You see, because Jacob worked seven years expecting to get Rachel and he got Leah. Then he feels like he was duped. He was deceived. And his father-in-law, uh, Laban, tells him it's not the way things are done in our country. It's not the way we do it. We do not give the younger before the firstborn. You see that? He could not have Rachel without first having Leah because Leah was the firstborn. Hello. Firstborn. First fruits, right? Who, which, which harvest is the first fruits for us? We're not the feast of first fruits. That is Christ. There is only one other feast of first fruits in in the in the in the in the uh, 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 in the law. Okay? That feast of first fruits is the feast of first fruits of the wheat harvest. And that is the feast of weeks. Seven Sabbaths and then bam. At the seventh Sabbath to the start of that 50th day. That's the beginning. Who goes? <clears throat> the firstborns or the first fruits. What harvest are they a part of? Well, they're the old. They're the old that goes before the new. You see, spring wheat is called new wheat and winter wheat is called old wheat. Is it because it's old and, and going bad? No, it's because it's old and it was planted late fall so it had taken root well before the time of passover so do you know what happens when winter wheat is harvested in late late spring to early summer it's used right away there's no delay in it it can be used right away do you know what happens with spring wheat and you'll understand that if you when you go watch the video spring wheat is planted in the spring it's not harvested <clears throat> excuse me until very late summer early fall and when it's harvested remember we did a teaching with the uh, kadosh and yoshan I, I always mix up which one it is but the one of them means you can't use it so even though it's harvested in in late summer to early fall it cannot be used until the second day <coughs> excuse me, of Passover the following year. Well, isn't that interesting? That's the spring wheat. <clears throat> that is the rapture group. They're both wheats. One is a winter wheat. One is a spring wheat. The pre-trib is the winter wheat. The mid-trib at the rapture in the seventh year of seals is the spring wheat. You see, this is why when the rapture, when the end of the first six years happens and the rapture is going to take place, they don't yet know where they're going. And what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to bury bones, right? The, the whole thing about burying bones in Israel and it'll be seven months. Hello. It's approximately seven months <clears throat> from when the rapture time would take place to when it would be observed. And isn't it fitting? Check this out. For those of you who haven't seen this before, isn't it fitting that in Revelation chapter Seven, where the great multitude rapture takes place, which was after the sixth seal and before the seventh, 
chapter 7 of Revelation ends with verse 17. See, isn't God amazing? Isn't it amazing these little clues that he's got in there for us everywhere? Well, we're going to go a little bit further with this on something we haven't shared in a little bit because there's something else that happens with winter wheat. Not all winter wheat is what's called a cash crop, okay? Not all winter wheat is a cash crop, okay? <clears throat> a cash crop, that means it's for profit, right? For the Lord to get what? His wages, right? This is the Lord getting the, the first fruits going. But do you know that winter wheat is generally, for the most part, grown as a cash crop? But do you know what else it's used for? It's used as a cover crop. We haven't talked about this in a little while. You see, the majority of people are going pre-trib as a cash crop, right? The prophets to the Lord. But there's a remnant who's being prepared in the revelation, who is being prepared in the revelation that when the Lord comes to complete it, they won't be wondering, oh, why didn't I go? <clears throat> why didn't I go? Why didn't I go? They already understand. They're a remnant group of that wheat that is chosen to remain. And do you know what happens with cover crop? Cover crop isn't cut down and used as the cash being sold, you see? Do you know what happens? It gets cut down and it covers, it, it gets destroyed, cut down and left in the field so that it brings more nutrients to the next crop. Hello. Hello. Do you think that sounds familiar? <clears throat> Do you think it's interesting that it's the winter wheat that has both, of which the majority is a cash crop, but in some cases they use the rest for cover crop so that the next round will be more plenty, more plentiful? Do you know why? Let me show you precisely what that means. Watch this. <clears throat> John chapter 12. And you're going to see, this is also still going to bring about the revelation of the understanding of it. Uh, let me see, where is it? Oh, we can read it right from here. Check this out. <clears throat> This is in John chapter 12, starting in verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should, should be glorified. Listen to this, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. <clears throat> He that loseth, lose, loveth his life shall lose it, but he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. What are these guys going to be a part of? Eternal life. What are they going to be willing to do? Give up their life. Except a kernel of wheat, a corn of wheat, should die, should fall to the ground and die. You mean like, a group of winter wheat who are chosen as symbolic cover crop? This, this is them right here being spoken about. This is them. What do they get for it? Eternal life. Do you know that this group being trained up, this group being prepared, that in the end, you know, they take part in the first resurrection and we know that they're called priests of the Lord, right? They're going to rule and reign with them as priests. So they're probably a typology and representation of priests already. They're going to have eternal life. They're going to be the ones that take place in the first resurrection. Do you know why this is interesting? Because if you've been around here for a little while, you know we have what, what's called chapters to years. These books that have revealed themselves to us. 
that have events within their chapters that relates to years and the events within them in the is to come. Look at what we got here. The law of Moses, right? Genesis, Exodus. We've got some prophets. We got some prophets and we got Psalms. We got the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And so this is what you see, see with, with Hosea and Ezekiel, I mean, Hosea and, and Zechariah, but Ezekiel as well. We got some prophets here where their individual stories reveal us prophecy of the end of days. But then we can go throughout the, the, the entirety of it and go from one to the other, to the other, to the other, and connect these stories together to show the picture of the revelation within them hidden within the books, within the prophets, within the law, for the is to come. That's the mystery that this person was going to be able to do. I'm telling you, wait till we get to him. It's going to blow your mind. It literally says that there are two portions of the way it would break down and be understood. We've been doing them here for four and a half, five years now. Well, Remember what he said, John chapter 12? Look at where John chapter 12 is. It's the time frame. It doesn't mean it's going to be the, the fifth seal is necessarily at the fifth year. It's not one seal per year. But in the typology, you see the fifth year that is connected to the fifth year of seals <clears throat> in John chapter 12. And in John chapter 12, what are they doing? Why did I keep, no, here it is. And in John chapter 12, what are they doing? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall unto the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What do we know about this group of people? Don't we know that this group of people is a portion that is going to put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles? Don't we know that they're Smyrna? that I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. You see, remember, right now we're we're in the we're in the in the end of days as the 777, but the only part of that 7 that is really going to be noticeable to the world is when the 50 days begins. You see, and when it does, it'll be tribulation and poverty. This is the beginning of the 40 days for the the chosen disciple remnant workers. And what does it say? Some of you, they're going to be put to death. Be faithful unto death. These are the workers. Well, John chapter 12 is connected to the, to the typology of what? The time of the fifth seal. These guys will have put their necks on the line. Huh. Kind of interesting, right? What does the fifth seal say? What if we go have a look and just to just get an idea to see what the fifth seal says? Revelation chapter six, verse nine. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, here it goes, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Hello. Time frame in the typology. Fifth seal in the fifth year of seals. <clears throat> John chapter 12. There they are. The ones who are dying, putting their necks on the line. And the ones who put their necks on the line, who are they? They're represented by a portion of wheat who become what? Cover crop. You following? Whoever this remnant worker group that are coming from here, maybe not all of them, but certainly a portion of them and probably all of them. Maybe there's many more that we don't fully know and maybe they understand in part, but they're starting to learn it and understand it. There are several hundred, if not now a few thousand coming to it now in Uganda. Are there more of them over there? You see? People are doing Bible studies on these teachings. And they're being prepared. They're understanding it. 
You see? Who is this group? We know who this group is, right? We showed that they were Smyrna. We know who they are as Smyrna. But we also know who they are from Romans 16. Right? They're the types of the Priscilla and Aquilas. The helpers in Christ Jesus who have for my life laid down their own necks. You see? Willing to put their necks on the line. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. What are they called? The first fruits of Achia unto Christ. You see that? This is the typology of who they are. Um, Petra did a, a video recently on this as well, talking about the typologies of Priscilla's and Aquila's throughout the ministry of some that she has already spoken to and has seen it in prayer over their lives with even brief visions. What do you call somebody who's getting visions and dreams? Who is supported by scripture? Mm, prophet? Right? Not me. Not in that sense. That's something that Peter gets. And in her video, when she talks about this, there are these Priscilla and Aquila types around the world that are from the ministry, that are in communication with her, that she has seen these things with being played out in dreams. We know this is happening. And I want it to really sink in. I want you to really see it and understand it so that you'll be prepared. It is preparing a group for the coming time of the end. You see, who is this group? Well, you guys know the whole story of, of 14 thurs, right? I've been calling ourselves 14ers, having no clue, right? We talked about that in a recent video and I've shared it over the years. I've been calling us 14ers because it's the revelation of the 14 years, only to find out later there was a group that were called 14thers because they stood on the truth of the 14th day of Nisan. And here we are, a group of people who stick with it, who see it, who are digging into it, whether they're just a little bit and they're starting to see it and they want to keep going because they, they, they can see something's there. Great, we want you. Or whether they're those who are seasoned and fully understand it and can do it almost as well as I can. There's a group that understands the truth of the 14ers as 14 years, the truth of revelation. Revealed through a ministry that is a typology of a, of a community established like the Essenes, but this time not on the Jewish side, on the house of Israel Gentiles grafted inside. And who were these early believers? Listen to this. The early believers had no building, no money, no political influence, and they weren't Christians. Do you know why they weren't Christians? They were called quadradecimen, or he says means 14. See, they were called 14ers. The, the word is actually 14thers, whereas we're called 14ers. But do you know what? The guy who, who wrote on this has no idea that there's actually a modern day group called 14ers. Isn't that bananas? <laughs> I love it, man. It's so over the top. You can't even make this stuff up because this stuff doesn't even come from me. But look at this, no money, no building, no political influence. Why won't they have these things? Because when Smyrna's portion comes, that worker group represented by Smyrna, the Priscilla's and the Aquila's of the world going out, that remnant group, that, that wheat portion that was, that was destined for the third heaven, but was chosen because they had been prepared as a remnant. This group right here, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. You will be in poverty. You will be going in villages. You will be living in the woods. You will be in places of protection. You will have power. You will have authority. You will have understanding. The completed work that's starting here in this ministry, that has started and been here for five and a half years, growing in this ministry, will be completed when the Lord comes and opens your understanding but you will be going through the tribulation. Some of you will be killed and you'll be in poverty. So it doesn't matter what you think you have now, it won't matter 
because you're going to have to rely on the Lord. Just like he said in Luke, right? He says, my little flock, right? The birds don't even worry about where they're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Let the world worry about those things. Does the world generally, maybe in poor nations, but generally, do you worry about what you're going to eat? And do you worry about what you're going to drink and so forth and, and the clothes? Generally, no. Yet, we're warned through this little flock group in Luke not to worry about those things because the Lord will provide. Have you ever wondered what that actually meant in the context of the is? You see, we look through the eyes of prophecy. We understand these things in the prophetic, in the, in the, uh, in, in the future is to come. And when we do this, it's so hard to see with many of these scriptures how on earth they relate to the is. Because try and apply that. Little flock, don't worry about what you're going to eat or don't worry about what you're going to drink. In the is, your pastor might give you the allegory of, of how to apply it to your life. When you're starving and being kicked out of your house and have no food, or you live in a third world country with absolute poverty, you come to Christ and your family comes to Christ and people are you're dying in the street because of starvation, even in Christ. How does that apply to that little flock as being, oh, just somebody in Christ? You see, is there a way to apply it to daily life? Yeah, sure. But when you have end time eyes, it, it seems 100% way more connected to the end of days. Because that little flock that he's talking to isn't the about 1.5 billion people claiming Christ. It's his little flock remnant bride worker that he's forewarning not to worry, just as he did to them back in his day. That's what's going on. Because you see, it's the was, the is, and the is to come. The is or the was was from creation until Christ's birth. The is is from Christ's birth until the moment of the pre-trib escape, and then it's the is to come. So the is that took place has another typology in the is to come. And when it starts, he's telling them, don't worry, little flock, about what you will eat and what you will drink. You see? Because I'll know your works. I know the tribulation you'll be in, and I know your poverty. But don't worry. Don't worry. Yes, some of you will be put in prison. Yes, you're going to be, some of you are going to be put to death. But know that you will not, do not let anybody take your crown. He that overcomes will, be not, will not be hurt by the second death. Why won't this group be hurt by the second death? Well, didn't we just cover that? They're the ones that are part of the first resurrection. These are the ones who put their necks on the line. These are the ones who will receive eternal life. Exciting stuff, guys. Awesome, awesome stuff. And if you'll remember, this stuff connects to Al DeBaron. Al DeBaron is the eye of Taurus, right? That bright eye of Taurus. That bright eye of Taurus, which is what the Holy Spirit revealed to us, one revelation in, in the knowing physical from the Holy Ghost, from a video that I was going to take down, which was about the 50 days, the 14 years, and the 50th Jubilee, which was the, the video was after the 50, the 14 years begin. I was panicked. I was going to take the video down. And I said, Lord, in the most determined uh, a, a prayer that I had ever given, Lord, if you don't give me a confirmation with a number 50 and that I've understood that I'm on track, that, you know, I'm understanding these things, I'm taking that video down tomorrow morning. I need to get something tonight that in relation to 50 and that I'm on track, you know, that I'm on target, that I'm understanding these things. And or you can give it to me by tomorrow morning when I wake up. If not, I'm taking that video down. Well, that video was so important to the revelation of the end 
that that night, you guys know the story. I got an email from Jodell just about one o'clock in the morning. I flipped out. She said it was from the Holy Spirit. I know what it means when I say the Spirit told me this. I know what it means if I'm lying. I'm telling you, this is what the Spirit told me. You know the story. She stopped the video at the 50 minute mark of the video that caught my attention for the number 50. And the Spirit told her to tell me that I was, in quotations, right on target. The word right on target means bullseye. Okay? You do a search, a Google search for right on target, it means bullseye. Bullseye, all these images everywhere pulled up on Google. I went to images and it was nothing but bullseyes. I keep looking through bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. Okay, so I get it, Lord. I'm on target, right? I'm right on target. I get it. But that's kind of where it was. I didn't know what else it was. But I kept searching and searching because I knew I'd finally received something in the physical from the Holy Ghost, which means it came from the Father and instructed the Holy Ghost to give it, right? You don't take that with a grain of salt, man. You got to take that with, with everything you have, especially when you asked for it. <clears throat> so what happens? I do a search right on target means bullseye. I'm searching bullseye. Turns out that the eye of Taurus, right? You guys know the, the bullseye of Taurus, right? This eye right here is the big bright eye called Aldebaran. My name in the English is Al Dubray or Alan Dubray. So it had a, it had a similarity, which was pretty cool. But what was crazier is that this eye is the 14th brightest star in the sky and 50 means bullseye. So the bullseye means 50 and it's the 14th brightest star in the sky. I started to freak out. It was Ed that found that it was the 14th brightest star in the sky. So of course I start digging into it more and a whole group of us start digging into it more. And the revelation from the video was that it was the number the Hebrew number 14 that equals the number 50, which is the word noon. The, the Hebrew number 14 is the number noon. Okay? It's the word noon for 14 in Hebrew, and it equals 50. And this I, which equals 50, it represents 50 and is the 14th brightest, had the name noon. And we say, well, where did it have the name noon? And you guys know the story, the Shroud of Turn. We know. With absolute certainty, the Shroud of Turin is absolutely true. The technology has proven it out more and more and more with more and more technology. And he had a pendant for which I believe, in my personal opinion, not a boast, but I believe from my own personal opinion in the experiences that, that have been happening for five and a half years, I believe the revelation of this pendant was for us. I believe that with all my heart. Because what was on that pendant? The head of Taurus. Ayin. Remember the right eye of Taurus when we're looking up in the sky? The right eye of Taurus, Ayin? That's the name of it. It means I. Ain or Ayin, it means I. It's the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means 70. Aleph being one, meaning the beginning. Remember Christ, the middle cross, being Aleph one, the beginning is represented by one, but it's also the just the head of Taurus in general, being Taurus. And the left eye, which is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, or the 14th brightest star in the sky, which is represented by the number 50, was the word noon. And the pendant Jesus was wearing was Ayin Aleph Noon. I've scoured the internet to see if anybody knows anything about this. And all they were able to show was numbers and counts of it. I have not found anything that anybody has realized that it's the head of Taurus. It's unbelievable. And what was the revelation? 70. So 70 comes to an end, right? From right to left, like the father. 70 comes to an end, then begins 50 days and the 14 years. It's the revelation of Jesus' pendant. How did we come across it? Noon. The revelation of noon, which brought us to the revelation of the eye of Taurus called the bullseye or right on target. How is that possible? Do you know, let me show you this. Do you know, for those that are newer, 
that the revelation in that video and how it came about, again, it was a process, but how it came about was that in Revelation 13, starting in verse 16, actually it starts in verse uh, 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 8, it says the tribe of Ephraim, see, of the tribe of Ephraim, Osi, the son of Nun, okay? Osi is the name Hosea, deliverer. What is one of the books that we've revealed that is open to us in chapters to years? It's the book of, where are you? Hosea, 14 chapters. In, in, the, in the book of Romans, Paul tells us that, <laughs> that um, the Lord had a beloved, right, in Osi that wasn't his, that would be his. Because Hosea or Osi, the deliverer, is written to the Gentiles or the, the house of Israel, right? Scattered throughout the earth. The Gentiles grafted in. And here he is, Ephraim of the tribe of Ephraim, Osi, Yeshua, the deliverer, the son of Nun. What happens? Moses changes the name of Osi, the son of Nun, to Yeshua. Yeshua. Joshua or Yeshua. What is this a picture of? Who is our deliverer? Christ is, of course. Who is Yeshua? Jesus is, of course. You see, he's the deliverer and he's the savior. He is the O.C. and he's the Joshua or Yeshua. Well, who's his father? His father is Noon. What? Wait a second, what was noon? The 1450. The 1450 connects to the Father as noon. And it's the Father who gave the revelation led by the Spirit to this person in the final generation to prepare a group in the revelation of understanding without dreams or visions. Prophesied over 2,000 years ago. Look at what noon means. You don't believe me? Look at what noon means. Perpetuity. Perpetuity. Look at the, look at the word it comes from. Perpetuity, the, the root word, to re-sprout, to be perpetual. Do you know what the word perpetual means? Check this out. The word perpetual means never ending or changing. Who do you think that was? <laughs> do you think maybe it was noon? You think maybe it was noon? Noon revealing noon? Craziness, right? Let me show you something with Al DeBaron. I did not realize this. As I was digging, right, I was getting excited now. I was, my, my shoulder, I, I slept through the night. Two nights in a row, I slept right through the night. Everything's fine, and guess what? My shoulder, I'm, I'm doing like full rotations and everything. Nothing hurts. Everything lifted when I was led to the revelation and to bring this forward. Look at Al DeBaron. You know that Al de Baron, I'm not going to go into all of this, but do you know Al de Baron is called one of the four royal stars? There are four royal stars that each have a section of the sky. There's a guardian angel. Now, this is more astrology, but it, we're not talking about astrology here. We're talking about the movement of the sun, moon, and stars, not what these guys think it is. You can go do your own research for the four royal stars. There are four of them. Aldebaran is one of them. Aldebaran is the one in the bull. The one that the Spirit gave us as 1450. The ministry is about the 1450. And the video was about how Noon was the father of Hosea Osi, who has his name changed to Yeshua as if it's the end of the six years of seals. He's no longer the de deliverer, but now he's coming as Yeshua. And his father's name is Noon. 
and I knew by his father's name, Noon, I remembered the Hebrew alphabet that that was one of the letters. And when I went and looked, it was 14, and I put all that video together, and that was the one that the Holy Spirit confirmed. It's one of the four guardian or the four angels. And it is believed, and I'm not going to go into all of this, but it is believed that each of those four cardinal stars, out of those four, they all have a representation of a person on the earth. The first three, I think it related to, to Adam, Enoch, and Noah. And do you know what the fourth one is? The fourth one is the one who would have revelation. What? <laughs> I, you can't make this up. I was telling you guys, it, it's impossible. You wouldn't even know how to make this stuff up. You see, not only does Al Dubaron represent the follower, as the eye of the bull, Al Dubaron is the eye of revelation. He's also called the eye of revelation. To the one who received the revelation? I told you this was over the top. I told you it gets crazy. And I, I'm just getting started with the crazy. I'm going to show you something that is going to prove to you that not a single thing that I have ever shown or led throughout the entirety of this ministry was a lie. Nothing. Oh, I've been wrong about dates, but it wasn't because I lied. It was a process of revelation like the entirety. Just like we can go to the beginning of creation and show it in the revelation at the end of days. It, the whole story is a fractal. Matthew, Mark, Luke is Luke, Mark, Matthew. Luke, Mark, Matthew takes you right back to the beginning of creation, right to the end of days. But when you're going to see what you're going to see on top of all of this, you're going to know that it couldn't have been invented because it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are 2,000 years old. Craziness, right? Over the top? <laughs> you bet it's over the top. Do you understand why there was a wait? Do you understand why I feel so burdened? It's, it's, I, I don't even like to use the word burden. It's not a burden. It's just because he doesn't speak to me, I don't get dreams and visions, but I get it through his word. He speaks to me, you can say, through the word in the revelation of it opening. But as just some dude in Canada in his garage, in, the, in his like little sanctuary that he built, it's, it's over the top to think about. And to think, this is why I say when you ponder on these things and you ponder for a moment, and realize what is actually happening here. That's where the weight comes on me. That is something I've told you that over the years, I don't like to think on too much because I knew it would feel too heavy on me. But as the time has gotten progressively now to the point where we are here, we are now in the month of Savan, brothers and sisters. Congratulations. We're not, he's knocking at the door. Then now that we're so close, I just felt, Lord, please help me to understand what's been happening. You know, who am I? Who are we? What, what is actually happening? Can it be understood? Was it meant to be understood? You see? Well, check this out. Al de Baron, do you know the greatest point of, of its activity starts May 29th? What? The story of the revelation that led us to Al de Baron. The eye of the bull, the bull's eye. The story that led us to it was the revelation of noon being the 14th letter equaling 50, that is the bullseye of Taurus. And 
its peak day begins on the 29th of May. If this is the seventh Sabbath on the 8th, uh, on the 28th of June or the 8th of Sivan, do you know that the 9th is the beginning of the 50 days? And as we said, now there is a potential connection in, in a very revel, relevant number of 717 at the end of 50. We know that from, from Luke in order, chapters 1 and 2 in particular, and from Isaiah 9, that there's, an, there's a light affliction at the escape that takes place in Israel before the connection to the Son of Man's birth, which is the 15th of Sivan. So it still is highly probable, but not guaranteed, but highly probable that it all begins in one week. And if this is the beginning of the 50, which is what it would equal, we've been talking about it for a long time, turns out I'm doing the research this weekend, and May 29th is the peak of what? Taurus? Is the peak of, of the I in I? No. Is the peak of the I for Aldebaran. Do you know what makes it the peak? Check this out. <clears throat> here we are today. Okay. This is Jerusalem. You see down here, this is Jerusalem. I think I've paused the time yet. So we're the 21st right now. There's the sun. This is Aldebaran. You see that? There's Aldebaran. 14th brightest star in the sky. Represents 1450, and here's the sun. And it said that the 29th is the peak time in conjunction with Aldebaran. Do you know why? Check that out. The sun is over the other eye of Ayin at what would be the completion of 70 years at the Feast of Weeks of the true 70th. And you have the eye of 70 and the eye of 50 in their type of conjunction at its peak beginning on the 29th of May. You know, anybody that thinks I make this stuff up, <laughs> you're just not listening. You're really just not paying attention. You're not following this story that's going on here. It's over the top. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm just getting started. Here's a nice little reminder from the Gospel of Thomas, right? The apocryphal one. The disciples said to Jesus, this is to, to strengthen you guys again. Tell us how our end will be. Okay, again, talking about what? The end. This is the disciple group. They're asking about the end. Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning? Yes, we have. That if you look, uh, uh, sorry, that you look for the end? Yes, that's exactly what we've done. For where the beginning is, there the end will be. That's precisely what we've been revealing. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. What was the beginning? Aldebaran, the eye of Taurus. He will know the end. And what? will not experience death. Pre-trib, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Let me ask you something. This seems quite specific, doesn't it? Doesn't this seem very specific to you? <laughs> I, I, I always catch myself. I know I'm asking rhetorical questions and sometimes I seem to give too long of a pause. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah wait a second, rhetorical. <laughs> so just, just ponder on this. Pause this and read it again for yourself slowly. Does this not seem, in verse 18 of the Gospel of Thomas, to be something very specific? Does this sound like it's it talking to the entire group of pre-tribbers, prepared, ready, and watching? No, it doesn't, does it? Who has then discovered the beginning that they look for the end? Do you know anybody outside of this ministry that's understood this? For where the beginning is, there the end will be. What? Where on earth 
Have you ever understood this except here in this ministry? That takes it all the way back to the beginning of creation to reveal the end. And that in the end was the revelation that brought us back to the beginning. <laughs> you see? If they haven't been learning this, and it's not understood by the world, then this clearly isn't talking to an entire group of people, is it? To enti the entire group of pre-trip. There's a specific group of people being spoken to. And somebody who is he who will bring about this understanding of it. Awesome. Awesome, awesome stuff. Well, now let's go into this part in Luke chapter 24. Now we're going to get into this. Okay? That, that was, that was a, like a refresher, a, a strengthener, uh, 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 an understanding of the revelation, the, some parts and pieces to show that, that not only the was, not only the is, but also literal historical events, the sun, the moon, the stars, the meanings, the definitions, the numbers, what actually happens in crops, all of it revealed in their portion. Well, check this out. All of that to prepare you and to build you into what's coming. So that you will be reminded, so that if somebody is newer, they will begin to understand it and grasp it more. And please remember, this has nothing, zip zero zilch to do with me and the pride. It's the fact of the revelation of it all that is undeniable, that it was going to be given to somebody in the final generation, and at no point outside of even the final generation over the last 2,000 years has it ever been revealed before this ministry. Because had it been revealed, you wouldn't have needed this ministry we would have been all learning it for the last 2,000 years. But it was to be given to someone in the final generation. And this person was prophesied because there was a was type of him before the time of Christ, preparing a group for when Christ came the first time. As this one with a community is preparing a group for the coming of Christ in the end of times. You're going to see. It's impossible to have been made up, not only because of all the revelations that we've, been, that we've revealed over the last five and a half years, but because we've got ancient scrolls from over 2,000 years old that said this counterpart person was coming in the final generation. Man, it freaks me out. See? <laughs> Told you, man, I don't like to think about it too much. It pulls the heartstrings, gets the mind saying, what? I want to remind you guys of this. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44, and even 45. We've talked about it a number of times over the years, and even lately, because we've even showed how this word for understanding, out of all the places, see, understand, understanding, understanding, understand, it's, it's all over the place. But this one word for understanding is used 24 times and only once in the book of Revelation. Because this understanding is going to be given to them of the things of the Lord that still must be complete in the end of days. And it will include the understanding of the Antichrist as well. This is the same understanding from the description of the Antichrist with the mark of the beast and the worshiping of his name and so forth. These will be the ones to finally understand. Makes sense, right? They're the ones refusing the mark. They're the ones teaching people to keep away from the mark, teaching them and prophesying and, 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 and preaching, bringing people to the truth. You gotta remember, we're talking about the entirety of earth 
everything in a moment changing for eternity. Something that has never happened in human history is about to happen to tens of millions of people. I believe the exact 8 billion people will be reached on that day for the population of the world, even though part of the world will tell you it's already reached. Some say it's happening in June, by the way. And at that moment, 1.8% 1 uh, of the population of the world, about 2%, I believe it's 1.8% exactly, is 144 million people are going to vanish. Everything is going to change in that moment. And there's going to be a group, this disciple group, Luke 24 group, Smyrna type, Priscilla's and Aquila's will be aware, will be ready, will be strengthened, having been prepared in the revelation of these things, waiting for the Lord to come, <coughs> will feed them at a banquet that he's going to have for them because their portion was with the pre-trib, but they were chosen to remain at his, as his remnant worker bride. And look what he's going to do to them. <clears throat> Luke 24, verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. When this started for me, you guys will recall, those of you that have been around for a bit, and I spoke about it recently, that when I came across this piece of scriptures, we started to really understand the 50 days that came before the 14 years. As, as it was growing in understanding, we understood it was Luke, then Mark, then Matthew, that Luke is the pre-trib bride, Mark is the left behind sleeping church, right? The world that'll wake up and, and, and be the great multitude of the rapture in the seventh year of seals. And then seven years of Judah is trumpets. And Judah, during the seven years of seals, are already fled throughout the earth. Captive, fled to the mountains, so that Jerusalem and God's land can rest for seven years for the disobedience that they have done in it. You see, the, the church is no different than the typology of the Sadducees, Pharisees. Not that they're all bad. And the, all the Sadducees and Pharisees, you know, they, they weren't all bad. <clears throat> in particular, the, what was it? The, the, was it the, I always mix it up. The Pharisees, they would go by scripture, but they, they would go too much to the, to the interpretations instead of the word. The scenes would go right to the word. We go right to the word. The one who would receive the revelation of the end would get it through the revelation of the word. You see, these, these things, this, this portion that's coming is a group being prepared. And, and when I started to understand this, I've told you guys this story even over the last few years, that about, oh, maybe four-ish, four and a half years ago, <clears throat> when I had realized what this was talking about, within me, as I was teaching on it, I was a little bit nervous and panicked inside so as i'm talking and giving the teaching in my own thoughts i'm actually having a conversation with myself while i'm talking and teaching being a little bit nervous about this because at that point i knew nothing about the law of moses which is the first five books of the bible we had the psalms we started to understand and we were well into the Psalms and understood their prophetic portions in the is to come. But at that point, we were just starting to get into the prophets. And how did it start with the prophets? It started with Zechariah and Hosea. I was watching a video from a brother who had no idea this was there, but he mentioned how Hosea was written to the Gentiles and Zechariah is to the Jews, right? So you can say the Gentiles, the world, the house of Israel grafted in, right? Gentiles grafted into the house of Israel and Zechariah is to Judah. See, so we've got to Judah, right? Gentile, uh, Hosea to Gentiles, Zechariah to Judah. And I noticed that it had 14 chapters each. So I freaked out. I instantly went through the Bible and I looked for every book that had 14 chapters. There were only two. And when I saw that, I knew instantly 
because of other things that were happening in the Psalms and Acts, I knew that I was going to find the revelation of the 14 years within both portions to the, to the Israel side and to the Judah side. And lo and behold, that was exactly what happened. Well, that was only beginning when I came to understand what Luke 24 and who it was talking to in the portion of time for the is to come. There was still a ton of prophets to understand and to go through. That already made me nervous reading this. But what made me ner more nervous was that as I was reading this, <clears throat> I understand that even though we had the Psalms and we've always grown in more detail, there was going to be a lot more to come in the prophets, but that I suddenly knew in my heart that I was going to have to begin to understand even more mysteries that were to come that were going to be revealed in the first five books in the Law of Moses. And in that moment, I was nervous. I didn't know how long it would take. I didn't know if we'd be able to get to it. But if time was permitting, it was going to be that when, it was, when the time would come of the end, and it was here, that we would have the revelation of the prophecy of the is to come from the Law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And what do we have now? The prophets, the Psalms, and the Law of Moses. Way beyond this, <clears throat> these are just the ones that are within their books. Each chapter has a piece revealed in the is to come. And the prophets are the best place to do it. Zechariah, as you guys know, is my favorite because it is the most clear, especially the beginning and the second half. It is so abundantly clear. It, it's over the top ridiculous how clear it is to the revelation of the end of days. So for me, it's the prophets. <clears throat> but where's another one that I really like? The, the creation story of Genesis in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, of Genesis, the creation story. Have we not gone through Genesis now and revealed the first 21 chapters in Genesis and many other things within it from, from Jacob with Leah and Rachel, from, from Abraham and Abraham and his two brothers to, to um, Abraham and his first son to, to Isaac, his second son, and how it equaled the 14 years, and on and on and on. What about Exodus? Exodus is one of those chapters to years. All right, we have a story within Exodus. We've gone through Leviticus. We've shown the revelation of Leviticus within the, the, the laws uh, of the harvests, but we've also shown even into Leviticus 26 that for their disobedience, they must be removed for seven years, the seven times for the disobedience since they've had Jerusalem. This is why they're about to be removed at the end of 70 and be removed for, 70 year, uh, for seven years during the portion of seals, which is going to be against the world, even though it will begin with them being removed for the, from Jerusalem and Jerusalem destroyed. And then it'll break out to the whole earth while the Jews are scattered. They're either fled to the mountains or taken captive and killed. We've got numbers. The book of Numbers revealed many things of which we've already talked about. Like, like the story of, of uh, uh, um, Osi, right? As Hosea being changed into Joshua and his father being Nun. <clears throat> what about Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy, we've gone through Deuteronomy and we showed the typology of Moses. And the typology of Moses that ends at the end of Deuteronomy Moses dies and he can't take them over into the promised land because who does? Joshua, whose name is Yeshua. Yeshua, Jesus coming at the end of the sixth seal, who's going to be the one to lead them over into paradise, to lead them back in the rapture. And when does that happen? Joshua chapter one. You see, guys, we have gone through it. We've now got this revelation that three, four years ago, four years ago and changed was freaking me out. Do we have it now? <clears throat> you better believe it. 
We have the revelation of the laws of Moses in the is to come, the prophets in the revelation of their is to come, and the Psalms. And what you're about to see is that not even the prophets could understand the revelation that was hidden within them. You see, because the Lord gave them the dreams and the visions to write it down. The one chosen for the final generation is the one who would receive the revelation through their written words in their understanding to discern the is to come. Over the top. Over the top. <clears throat> and where does a lot of this begin? Well, it begins in the book of Habakkuk. You see, Habakkuk is, is like many of us, is like myself and like many of us. <clears throat> right? We're watchmen. Watchmen on the wall and crying out to the Lord and saying, my goodness, Lord. You see, what was Habakkuk doing? Habakkuk's cry was for Jerusalem. Our cry is for the entirety of the globe. We're seeing it playing out. We're, we're seeing the digital currency. We're seeing the, the events, the, the globalization. Everything is global. We're seeing what happened with, with, the, with the COVID and everything else and what it was a preparation for. It's true. But on top of that, we are also almost identical to Habakkuk in the sense that he was a watchman on the wall also for Jerusalem because he could not believe what they were doing. Their, their defilement, their disobedience, their idolatry. That he was like, Lord, how much longer are you going to wait? And listen to what the Lord tells him in Habakkuk 1 verse 5. Behold, you men, uh, sorry, behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelous, marvelously. For I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told to you. You see, what's coming, they have no clue. Remember, they despised going in and hearing or hearing from the prophets in ancient days. They were always going after the prophets. They didn't want to hear from them. Because prophecy is generally what? <laughs> they call it doom and gloom. It is not doom and gloom when you understand. It is not doom and gloom. Is it difficult? You better believe it's difficult. Is it a difficult message to give? Absolutely it's a difficult message to give. Because why? Because it sounds like it's doom and gloom. But it's not doom and gloom because of the prophets who are given the message. It's doom and gloom to them for their disobedience who don't want to change. You see, prophets aren't there to doom and, groom, uh, doom and gloom. They're there to wake them up, to prepare them, to get them to change their ways. And this is the greatest of all times. Because this is the end of days. This is the end. When these 50 days and 14 years are over, it'll be the final jubilee in the beginning of the millennial reign. This is the end. It's all true. Oh, when is he coming? When is it going to happen? Oh, you keep saying this. Oh, you keep saying that. Yeah, do you know that those people are written about in Scripture as well? Those who leave and want to go and tickle the ears? Those who, who fool themselves and deceit others, saying, no, this is what the truth is. Go this way, follow us. Trying to take people away. It's all spoken about by these guys. We must be prepared. We must be diligent. We must be strong. We must be praying, seeking, searching, loving, repentant, sharing. You see, this story all begins in Habakkuk. And in Habakkuk 2, the second portion of verse 4, but the just shall live by faith. You see, in verse 3, it says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Hmm. 
Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. This first portion is those who are lifted up and, and not upright within themselves. But the just shall live by his faith. See, it's a portion of time. There is a mystery embedded in this, and it's been understood for a long time, or at least especially in the last several decades, from the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let's go into some of this breakdown. Here's a little commentary on it to start. And again, this is from Blue Letter Bible. So it says, how shall we live in the end of days? See, Habakkuk 1, uh, Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4. Like a faithful watchman stationed on a high fortress tower <coughs> overlooking the valley below, Habakkuk waited to see the answers to his prayers. Hello. Isn't that what we've been doing? You guys individually as well within your own lives and events around you? Isn't this what I was talking about was happening in my life? And then we say, okay, fine. <clears throat> I'm, I'm taking a break. I got to take a break. I need, to, I need to understand something from you, Lord. Otherwise, I'm, I'm feeling too overwhelmed by all of this. I, I need to understand what's happening. So just like Habakkuk, waiting for the answers to the prayers. Here was a prophet embraced and called by God to bear the burden of watching Judah sink into irreparable moral quicksand. Violence, injustice, and idolatry characterized the once peaceful, just, and faithful people. Burdened by the sad turn of affairs, the prophet priest. Hello. See, there's the priest connection again, right? Shouted and screamed unto God for answers to his troubled heart. He wondered why God appeared not to hear the pleas for Judah. He was perplexed why the Lord had burdened him to watch the moral and political decline of his nation while it appeared God didn't share his heavy heart. The Lord replies, the Lord replies to the prophet's cry <clears throat> in Habakkuk uh, 1, 5 through 11. He urged the, trub the troubled prophet to look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe if it were told to you. <clears throat> like the nation's watchman, Habakkuk would see God's sovereign hand rise up, uh, raise up the Chaldees to be his rod of chastisement. They would invade Judah like a mighty east wind gathers up the sand and takes it into captivity. Hello. Isn't this precisely what we've been talking about? <clears throat> Excuse me. Isn't this exactly what we keep sharing, this revelation in this 50-day portion? There's going to be the light affliction in the north. The Lord will return after the wedding and after that light affliction. He will warn Judah as Jonah did, but he's going to do it for Judah <clears throat> and probably be in different parts of the world. I don't know, but for sure Judah and Jerusalem and warn them. That as they see themselves about to be compassed, about to flee. Because when the end of the 40 days and then the three days and the end of the 50 days comes, the compassing about that will have happened in those three days, Jerusalem will then be destroyed. We know who's bringing this destruction. This, this entire connection is so perfectly associated, as we've shared over the years, to Isaiah chapter 9. The light vexation first that comes in the two northern cities and the typology of Zebulun and Naphtali. Afterward, a more grievous affliction. But before that grievous affliction, unto us a child is born. Connected to the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2. After the seven to the eight days of John's birth and circumcision. Then what do you have? Syria coming. Syria and the Philistines coming and devouring with the open mouth and destroying them. It is the exact same story. This is exactly what we've been doing. This is exactly what we're trying to get out to the world. But pastors and, 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 and Jews, and so they don't want to hear this. They want to have their happy-go-lucky, tickle some ears and, 
and say a few words in the is to give people comfort and rest? All of them? No, not all of them. 90 plus percent? Absolutely. It's, it's hard to break through, right? You see, people know, certain people who have studied these things with this person we're going to be sharing on, know that this person is prophesied to come. The, the church has been seeking understanding of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to for centuries. And yet, when presented with it, they can't believe it's actually happening, so they dismiss it. We've talked about that for years. You see, this fierce, violent, and unjust nation would crush everything in its path, including Judah. When the Lord completed his message, the prophet, prophet Habakkuk in, uh, sorry, the prophet in Habakkuk 1, 12 through 13, praised God. He called him my holy, everlasting Lord and covenant-keeping God. <clears throat> you see, it's all the same type of prof uh, prophetic time frame. And what you find out is it's way deeper <clears throat> than the typology of Habakkuk being as what's happening here in this ministry now and has been for a while. But this typology is this same crying out over Jerusalem of what's coming and over the world of what's coming. Because it's not just a little regional thing anymore. Now it's a global thing going on. And, and the weight and the understanding of the deeper things need to be understood. You see, you've heard me talk about this before. These deeper things need to be brought to, to understanding before the tribulation can begin. Otherwise, wouldn't you think they'd be able to stand before the Lord and say, nobody knew? How did we know? It was never made known. There was no revelation. You mean you hid these mysteries within the prophets, the, the law of Moses and the Psalms, and it was never made known until it began? It would almost seem like maybe they have a, a point to stand against the Lord with, right? But no. Because like everything, the Lord said he would make it known before it happens. That's what's happening here. And just as Habakkuk was crying out for the exact same time frame of things in, in what was taking place in his portion, it is precisely <clears throat> what is happening here in this portion of time. You see, he was a prophet, but he was also what? A priest. What do we know about this worker group? This, this worker group, this remnant portion being prepared? They're the ones that have part of the first resurrection. They're the ones that put their necks on the line. See, they're the ones of the first resurrection, of which the second one has no power. And what shall they be? Priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. <clears throat> All of the is to come is there. But what's crazy within Habakkuk is within those verses, there's a deeper mystery of Habakkuk. But the real revelation of it couldn't happen until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found of these things, these parchments, of these writings that were about 2,000 years old. And this person is the one called, we've talked about it before, the teacher of righteousness. The teacher of righteousness is given in the Dead Sea Scrolls to be an individual who is commonly, commonly believed to have played a, de a decisive role in the formation and early history of the group assumed here to be the Essenes that lies behind the Dead Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls. You see, this teacher of righteousness is somebody who was part of the was at the time of Christ's first coming. But what you come to find out is it goes way deeper because there is a prophesied counterpart to him. And this teacher of righteousness that is to come is not the teacher of righteousness of old who is coming again because he is not a Messiah figure. He's not being resurrected to come back. It is a counterpart of his who was prophesied for the final generation. 
And the absolute clearest evidence of it is that the first teacher of righteousness in the formation of the community of the Essenes did not have the revelation of the prophets for the prophetic end of days is to come. Hello. It would be his counterpart. And I'm going to prove it to you. Watch this. Let's go into this one. This is just one little piece in this one. So in the commentaries, I'm going to go to this third paragraph here on this one. And just read uh, a portion of this one um, from right here. So this is from the Jewish Virtual Library about the teacher of righteousness. And you'll notice, again, it's connected to these mysteries within this, this wording within Habakkuk. And it's all about this teacher of righteousness within it. Uh, so from the teacher of righteousness onward. The teacher, so he's called teacher of righteousness, righteousness, he's called teacher, he's called teacher of the community, all sorts of things, right? We've touched a little bit on him before in one video. So the teacher plays a prominent part in the, expo uh, in the exposition. Those among the nations <clears throat> who are called upon in Habakkuk 1.5, right? We covered that, Habakkuk 1.5 that they wouldn't believe the thing if it was shown to them, if it was told to them, to wonder and be astonished at the work which God is about to do, which they will not believe though it be told, are the unfaithful ones who paid no heed to the words which the teacher of righteousness spoke to them by the mouth of God, refusing to believe when they hear all that is coming upon them, the last generation did you hear that all that is coming when they hear all that is coming upon them the last generation you see the final generation wasn't 2000 years ago the last generation is the one of the 70 that goes to 80 and then a short time that's the final one that is the one that is coming to an end that is the one we're a part of. That's the generation where this counterpart end time teacher of righteousness is going to be a part of bringing about the revelation. From the mouth of the priest. Well, that makes sense that he would be considered a quote unquote typology of priest. Whose heart God put wisdom to interpret all the words of his servants, the prophets. Hello. This is in line with what is already known about the teacher's mission from the Zedekite ad admonition. The teacher understood the course of future events by divine illumination. On Habakkuk 2, the commentator states that God commanded Habakkuk to write the things that were coming on the last generation, but did not inform when the epoch would be fulfilled. And as the words, so he ran, uh, so he may run who reads it, their interpretation concern, concerns the teacher of righteousness to whom God made known all the mysteries of the words, his servants, the prophets. The words of the prophets remained mysteries. This is another way for mysteries, Razim, right, Raz? So the words of the prophets remained mysteries, listen to this, even to the prophets themselves, until the interpretation, or Fesher, or Pesher, so until the interpretation was revealed to the teacher. After that, the mysteries were mysteries no more, at least to those who heard and believed him. On them the words of Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by his faith, were spoken. Their interpretation concerns all the doers of the law of the house of Judah. See, it's different than the house of Judah this time, right? This is, you have to understand, when they're talking about this, in, in the was of the teacher of righteousness who was there, they're at the same time trying to apply it to the end of days, final generation teacher of righteousness. And they're still saying, see, Judah, Judah, just as the Essenes. But we're not in their time anymore. 
We're in the global time. We're in the Gentile age. These things of the teacher of righteousness were written before Christ came. You see, we're living in the Gentile age. This is the one for the world, including Judah this time. So it's not the same type of, 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 of priest of this entire priestly line through Judah. No, it's a priestly line through the discipleship of Jesus Christ from the is in the typology of the is to come. Who are? You guessed it. The ones being prepared in the revelation of the is to come who will be his Luke 24 Smyrna disciple workers having to have been prepared in advance. Whom God will save from the house of judgment because of their toil and their faith in the teacher of righteousness. I told you it was crazy. I told you it was crazy. Well, this is still just getting going. Watch this. Okay. Again, we've talked about these things connected with Zechariah, right? Zechariah is an incredibly awesome, awesome book. Again, the prophets. We have so many revelations from the prophets, from Jeremiah to Zechariah to Ezekiel to Isaiah to Hosea to Jeremiah. I mean, Amos, I mean, Micah. And they're all what? Revelation through the word. Not dreams and visions like these prophets had. It's the revelation of the word, the understanding of their words in the is to come. This is precisely what we're told this teacher of righteousness would have been given from the Lord in the final generation. See this? Here's that cry. This is that same type of cry as Hosea, and this one's by the angel of the Lord. It says, O Lord of hosts, in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. How long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years? I was jealous for a great jealousy. I was sore displeased and it helped forward the affliction. Bang, now it's about to begin. We know it's connected to the time frame of the end of the true 70. We've understood these things. We've broken down these books. And if you remember what I said, some of the books we can go specifically in those books, chapter by chapter, and break down the revelation of the is to come in them. But we can also go through several books, piecing all of their portions together into build the bigger picture of more events that are taking place within that same year time frame of events. There's two ways of doing it. That's what we've been doing here for the last five and a half years. You see, what do we know about Daniel? Here's a great one with Daniel that we've spoken on many times and especially recently. 70 weeks, 70 feasts of weeks are determined. And what do we know about the first seven weeks here? Everybody skips over that. You see, it says what? From the going forth to rebuild and to restore Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, which means it's got to be attacked and destroyed before there could be a commandment to rebuild it. But from that commandment to rebuild it, what's going to happen? Seven weeks as seven years. What are those seven weeks of seven years all about? You got it. It's the first seven years of seals while they're removed from the land. And World War III breaks out. The Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, the False Prophet. All of these things during seals till the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals on Heavenly Mount Zion. So what's happening during those seven years when they've been removed? <clears throat> Why were they removed? It's what we were talking about in Leviticus. You see, back to the law of Moses. We can go in uh, ver Leviticus 26, verse 21. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, again, see for their disobedience, I will bring seven times for seven years more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. All right, go down to verse 24. And I will walk, then will I walk contrary unto you and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. See, he's telling them this is all happening for seven times for your sins. <clears throat> Look what he says he's going to bring upon them, the sword. 
The red horse rider starts the sword. You see, the discourses of Mark and Matthew start with the sword. That shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. You see, he's bringing a sword upon them that will avenge the quarrel of his covenant. <clears throat> Wasn't this precisely the prophetic cry out that Habakkuk was doing? That is the prophetic in the is to come. And what did God do? He raises up the Chaldees, right? A, a violent and fierce people to bring about his judgment. That's precisely what all this is about. He's going to bring what? The sword by these guys to avenge the quarrel of his covenant. Precisely, if you remember, what did, what did Habakkuk say to God when he saw that he had done these things? He called him my holy everlasting Lord and covenant-keeping God. For their disobedience of their covenant, what does he say? To avenge the quarrel of my covenant. <clears throat> And when you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you. What's Matthew 24? The sword and pestilence. And you shall be delivered into the hand of your enemy. You see, bread taken, cattle taken, chastised seven times for your sin. This one's brutal in Leviticus 26, verse 29, about what's going to happen with their children. Because why? Because the Lord has turned from them. So they're going to be so distraught in their thinking. They're going to do things unthinkable that they would have never done before. You see? Verse 32. And I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. Hello. I will bring something upon them that will have never been believed had it been told to them. And here they are seeing it being astonished. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities, uh, uh, land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths. For as long as it lieth desolate, and you be in your enemy's land, then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. What was the story of Zechariah chapter 1? Seven years, no mercy. They've, they've been progressively getting worse. Guys, these are the revelations we've understood. You see, here it is again. At the year's end, Syria comes up with a small company and destroys them. This is the, the, uh, the Syria the same as Isaiah 9, the one that brings the destruction. See, again, there's the one from Isaiah 9. Then we're going to see some crazy things. Remember, we've shared on this over the last little while. Let's go to my favorite e-sword instead in Zechariah chapter 4. We know, we know who the two witnesses are. We've explained the two witnesses. We've broken it down. The two witnesses are the typology of Zerubbabel and Joshua. Okay? High priest and king, and another one being as king. <clears throat> Remember what happens? During the seven years of seals, in the midst of the seven years of seals, Zerubbabel is going to be the one overseeing only the foundation that's going to get laid. Only a remnant of Jews will be brought back, and during the seven years of seals, only the foundation will be laid over which Zerubbabel was heading. You see, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. Now listen to this. His hands shall also finish it. You see? His hands shall also finish it. Two olive branches, right? Who are the two olive branches? We know as we've gone further into this. Uh, we've got five. We go into chapter six of Zechariah. This is the typology, the end of the six years of seals. And what do we see? Zechariah 6, verse 11, take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua. Yeshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, okay? Joshua, again, is it the same one as the other? It's the typology, right? 
Now listen to this. Who is he going to be? He's going to be the high priest. Joshua, Yeshua. See, there he is, Yeshua. His name. He's going to be what? The high priest. Just as we've been teaching, Yeshua is going to be the fulfillment of the high priest Melchizedek that we were sharing in the last video in relation to Hebrews. And that's why it's in Hebrews 7 specifically, really getting into all the storyline of, of Zerubbabel because it will start the end of the sixth to the start of the seventh year of trumpets, uh, sorry, of seals. The Lord is there on heavenly Mount Zion. He's now going to be taking that role as high priest and king. But it's not on his own. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying thus, spe uh, speaketh, thus saith, sorry, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. You see, the branch isn't the same as the high priest Yeshua. The branch, whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. You see that? Who's the one that builds the temple of the, world, of the Lord? Well, we were told it was Zerubbabel. He laid the foundation in his hands will also be the one to complete it. You see? So there's two of them here. They're the two witnesses. It's going to be the Lord, right, as, as high priest and king coming at the end of the sixth seal on heavenly Mount Zion. The other one is the branch, who is the modern day Zerubbabel. So now watch this. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. You see that? But even though he's the one sitting, the branch is the one sitting on the throne, who's the actual one who has the greater authority? Yeshua, the high priest. It's Yeshua, the high priest, who has direct connection to the Father. The branch that rebuilds it will become the king. But not only him, right? Listen to what happens. Uh, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. So he's going to be a king and he's going to be a priest, right? Listen to this. And the council of peace shall be between them both. We know who the two witnesses are. We've taught who the two witnesses are. They're going to be Yeshua, the Son of Man, the Lord, as Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest and king, who has the greater authority than the branch, who is the one who lays the foundation and will build it, who is going to be whoever the modern day Zerubbabel is. And they, will re they shall rule between them both, right? The council of peace shall be between them both. We taught on these things. We know these things. We've proven out these things. Let's keep going. You're going to see why I'm sharing on these things and why I'm getting into all of this. Now, remember, there's, there's a very specific, all of this that I'm sharing with you is to continuously lead you into the greater detail of revelation of this person, the, 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 the teacher of righteousness or the teacher. Because it's going to bring us back to this in another point. So you see, we know two things. We know that the Son of Man is coming back after the seven-day wedding. He's returning on the eighth day from the start of the 50. He's start coming back on the eighth day, and he's going to be here for 40 days as the Son of Man warning as Jonah did. When he comes, he is going to meet with the disciples, Smyrna, Luke-type group, Priscilla's and Aquila's. He's going to gather them and have a meal with them, and what is he going to do? Well, do you know as I said earlier, that for the past five and a half years, we've been revealing the is to come of the things yet to be fulfilled. See, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning the Lord. What have I been saying over the years about this? This is what's happening here in this ministry is not the completion of this. It is the revelation of it. It is the preparation of it. So that what? When the Son of Man comes, He will complete it. He will complete the revelation that will continue 
from what has been taking place here for five and a half years. Now that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It sounds crazy to think that you're a part of that, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound crazy? Don't you think it sounds crazy for me? To say that it's, that it's, that it's me, that it's through me and, and, and the revelation that's been given here? That we're all seeing, that we've all dug into, that we've all understood being revealed through me and the ministry here? Do you not think this is a way to, for me to, to have been freaking out over for five and a half years? Well, you're about to see that this teacher, the teacher of righteousness, the one who would be given the revelation of the prophets and the law, that this one who receives it, it says when the Lord shows up, he's going to take it from the teacher of righteousness who began it. He will continue it, having taken it from the teacher of righteousness and we'll complete it. What? <laughs> oh, that's that's a that's a freaked out, scared, panicked. Uh, what do we do with this? You see, have I known a little bit about this along the way and over the last couple of years? Yes. It hasn't changed me. So don't worry about this changing me. Don't let it change you unless to help you prepare more. But it hasn't changed me because there's always that grain of salt that says, but, uh, but here I am finally asking the Lord, crying out like, like Habakkuk. And I'm led back into it again in the greater detail of it. And I'm able to sleep through the night. My shoulder pain is gone. The weight is gone. I'm at ease. I think it's because, not only because it's true, I, I do believe it's true. Of course I do. Otherwise, these things would have been known somewhere else in the world and would have been known for the last 2,000 years, but they weren't. Well, it literally says that when the Lord comes, he's going to take it from the teacher of righteousness and carry it forward. Do you understand why I was sharing you this stuff about Taurus? Ponder on this now as to the depth of the reason why we were given, why I was given by the Holy Ghost right on target that led us to the bullseye of Taurus. Why the Lord was wearing a pendant that was Ayin Aleph Noon. And why I believe that that pendant was discovered and barely spoken about but revealed to us because it was shared and it was the revelation of the eye of Taurus. 70 begins 50. Taurus is the beginning. Doesn't it start to make more sense that whoever this is would be connected to the one revealing these things? But here's the point. I told you guys near the beginning that I don't know if this means that the teacher is gone at the beginning and this is when the son of man now yes this is absolutely when the son of man takes over and opens it completely but does it mean that the teacher is gone right away right like i've said some believe i remember trisha saying you know it would make more sense that the completion of the story that the revelation having been given that now the teacher goes and the lord finishes the work of the teacher by completing it in the disciples who remain this may very well be that point. However, as you're going to see through the, the, the understanding and the rev about this teacher and the words written about him, there's a reason why I was sharing the portion about the two witnesses, about Joshua as the high priest and king and the branch being Zerubbabel as the two witnesses. Because you're going to see wording within this that seems to have both accounts. So I'm not fully clear if it means that I don't have to be here because I've done my part and the Lord is now going to finish it in the disciples who were being prepared. 
or if I would still also remain as one of those disciples who prepared and then will also receive the fulfillment of it with the disciples. I don't know if, if it means I go here or if it means I go when the two witnesses show up. You'll see what I'm talking about. So we're going to go through different parts. This is, look at this, this is a, we're not going to go through absolutely everything, all right? That's not the point. We're going to go through just key points in this, but we are going to still cover at the same time a fair bit. So hopefully it won't take too, too much longer, but we got a little bit to read. Oh, after all these pop-ups. Oh, coffee. See, just as I was having my sip of coffee. So in this, I wanted to start in the part of the first paragraph. So again, I don't want to go into every part of, uh, of it, but you're going to see this guy breaks down. This guy has done a study of the teacher of righteousness. You see, this is what I was talking about. There are people around the world who have deep studied scripture, who have understood the, deep, uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and delved deep into them and know that there is this person, this teacher of righteousness for the time of the end who would be revealed understanding through the revelation of scripture. See, the eye of revelation, Taurus, hello. You see how it all connects? It's over the top. So um, let's just see. I don't want to go into too much in this first paragraph. Um, okay, but who is the teacher of righteousness? He is a prophet with God-given ability to interpret the law. You're going to see in a little bit. He's not directly a prophet. Like, you know, we've, there was talk on this in the past. There are prophets and there are those who operate, you could say, in the office of a prophet. You see, because prophets, in, in the sense of prophet, have dreams and visions, okay, of the, from the Lord. But this teacher of righteousness, the teacher, teacher of righteousness, is one that's been given the God-given ability to interpret the law. Now, when you see the interpreting of the law and so forth, <clears throat> it doesn't mean the interpreting of like the 613 law. It's not that. It's the interpreting of the revelations of the prophets and the interpreting of the law of Moses, okay? The first five books, of which it is said that he prefers the prophets. You see, you've heard me say that for years over Zechariah and some of these. So it's not in dreams, in visions that this typology of prophet comes from. It is different, and you're going to see it. He, he explains it. It says, in this paper, I will provide a basic description of the teacher by looking at references to him in the scrolls and by paying close attention to the peshrim, which means the interpretation, and the, the hadayot, which are the psalms that the first teacher of righteousness in the first community established by the Essenes teacher of righteousness in relation to this coming counterpart. So it says, I will then explore the nature of his apocalypticism. I hope by that, progre pro uh, sorry, I hope that by progressing in this manner, I will shed light on the nature of this elusive character the teacher of righteousness. <laughs> I love her. Yet. Ain't too elusive anymore, boys. So um, as we continue, as E.P. Sanders begins his quest for, for the historical Jesus, he explains that the best place to begin is with the facts. Likewise, as we try to understand the teacher of righteousness, it is preferable to begin with what we know about the teacher from the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves. This is what I was talking about. You'll see what I'm saying in a moment. Authors of the scrolls known as, uh, no, sorry, author of the scrolls know the teacher as the teacher, the teacher of the community, the teacher of righteousness, interpreter, interpreter of the law, priest, the priest. He is never explicitly referred to <clears throat> as a prophet, but descriptions, context, and tradition lead one to believe that the teacher is a prophet. The, Do the Damascus document, the commentary on Micah, the commentary on Habakkuk, you see, part of it, and the commentary on the Psalms use the titles teacher, teacher of the community, and teacher of righteousness. From such passages, we learn that the teacher 
is the founder of the community, right? Of a community. And that the present generation of the community looks to him as the historical authority. In all these references, the teacher, the teacher of the community, and the teacher of righteousness is a figure divinely chosen to expound on the law and set community members on the righteous path for the end of days. His words help prepare for the end. Again, sounds familiar, right? Who have listened uh, for the end, who have listened to the voice of the teacher of righteousness and have not despised the precepts of righteousness when they heard them. They shall rejoice and their hearts shall be strong and they shall prevail over all the sons of the earth. God will forgive them and they shall see his salvation because they took refuge in his holy name. Wild stuff, right? The interpretation. So here where it is with the interpretations of the law. So remember, it's those, it's those who are thirsty. It's those who have been seeking these things, who knew there were mysteries that had not yet been understood within the gospels, within the, the prophets and so forth. There were people that were thirsty, and that's what I believe just about every single one of you here in this ministry have told me about. Maybe I haven't spoken to every one of you, but all of those who have shared with me have all said the same thing. Oh my goodness, I knew it, and when I saw it, I said, that's it. I knew it, I understood, I could see it, I could follow it. They were thirsty, they were diligently seeking as Enoch, and that's part of the reward in the is. So the interpretation or the Peshram, it says, are interpretations of written prophetic texts that can be understood as unraveling of mysteries. J. Karmanak broke the Peshram into two categories. Okay, listen to this. Remember I was telling you there was two categories of the breakdown that I've been doing for five and a half years, unknowing that there was actually a, a description of it. Continuous which interpret a single book section by section. What? Isn't that what I was telling you guys? That we go to the book of Zechariah, chapter by chapter, section by section, bringing about the revelation hidden within it for the end of days. We do it with Hosea. We do it with Ezekiel. Prophet, prophet, prophet. We do it in the law. Genesis, Exodus and more you see what is it the first one is continuous which is an interpretation right uh, the which interpret a single book section by section and what's the other one thematic which consists of certain citations grouped around a thematic idea hello why don't you go right across chapter to chapter to chapter to chapter? We can go from book to book to book to book to book to book to book and see parts of verses within each and every one of these and build a greater picture around a thematic, around a scene of that period of time in the end of days to bring greater clarity to what's to come. That one is the second one that they revealed through the unraveling of the mysteries they have understood through these writings of this teacher of righteousness that he writes and reveals in two ways. One interpreting a single book and the other being thematic through a grouping of them. Dude, that's literally what I've been doing. <laughs> oh man, this is over the top. <laughs> you guys are a part of it. You're the ones being prepared, so don't laugh too much. Both of these forms of interpretation, right, of Peshram, are characterized by Raz, right? We spoke about that a moment ago. A term taken from the notion of the ancient prophets being introduced in their visions into the heavenly assembly of special knowledge. However, the Peshram take the idea of divine prophetic revelation a step further because they claim to contain the mystery of things hidden even to the prophets themselves who wrote the words now 
interpreted. Now interpreted by who? By the teacher. Hello. Hogan points to this quad, this this uh, this is from the uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. As an example of this, God told Habakkuk to write down that's that what would should happen in the final generation. You see, the final generation. But he did not make known to him when the time would come to an end. And as for that which he said, that he who reads it may read it speedily, interpreted, as we read earlier, this concerns the teacher of righteousness, to whom God made known all the mysteries of the words of his servants, the prophets. In the Pesher, the teacher understands what is to come because God allows him to unravel the mysteries of Habakkuk's prophecy, namely that the words, uh, uh, that the word, namely that within the words, God buries his plans for the founding of the community. Hello. We have a community, don't we? It's global though. It's not outside of Jerusalem this time. It's global. The rise of the teacher. So for the founding of the community. So within, God buries these plans for the founding of the community, the rise of the teacher, and the end of days. Once God gives the teacher prophetic understanding, the teacher unravels the mysteries in scripture and uses that new knowledge to create rules which regulate the community. In this manner, the entire community order, every rule, every hierarch, uh, 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 hierarchical uh, position is governed by the teacher's interpretation of scripture in anticipation of the end of days. It's almost like I don't need to say anything else. That right there is the story of what's been happening. You could take these. It, it's the story of what's been happening here. Continuous thematic, being revealed, the prophetic revelation through understanding, not through dreams and visions as the prophets, but the mysteries that the prophets themselves didn't know was in their writings or never understood because it wasn't for them. Moreover, because the teacher is the interpreter of the law, the Peshram provide additional insight into the teacher. That is, the Peshrim are the teacher's mode of divine revelation via interpretation of Scripture. By carefully examining how the teacher interprets Scripture, one can learn even more about the figure. For instance, the commentary on, ha on Habakkuk. Behold the nations and see, marvel and be astonished. For I accomplish a deed in your days, but you will, you will not believe it when told. They, the men of violence, are the breakers of the covenant, will not believe when they hear that all that is to happen to the final generation from the priest in whose heart God set understanding that he might interpret the words of his servants, the prophets, through whom he foretold all that would happen to his people and his land. Remember that? all that would happen to his people in his land? What's going to happen? He's going to destroy them, have them flee to the mountains, have them taken captive so that the land that is destroyed can rest. It's precisely what he's doing. What is going to happen to his people and his land? All these things we teach on in the Revelation. Brothers and sisters, we were written about. We were prophesied about over 2,000 years ago. Isn't that crazy to swallow? To wrap your head around? Does this give you permission to go and start boasting and, whoa, I can't believe it, that's me, and start telling it? No, no. I don't go around having these conversations with people. Are you crazy? It's already enough to bear just in teaching it and in knowing it and in, 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 in trying to reach others, but banging our head against the wall for, for most of the time, right? <laughs> Be ready, guys. In the passage, the teacher 
is a priest who has divine power to interpret scripture, namely the prophetic books. See, not only, but namely the prophetic books. Moreover, the teacher prefers the prophets because God imparted them with the knowledge of what is to come in the generation of the teacher. It has to be the final generation because it's being imparted to the teacher in the final generation. The teacher is given knowledge by God. You see, being given knowledge by God. Being given knowledge by God. The Father had to instruct the Spirit through Christ, had to instruct the Holy Ghost to make it known and be made re and, and re revealed to me. Did I know this? No, that's why I was freaking out for the first year and a half so much. I still freak out on occasion. But for the first year and a half, I mean, I, I must have had swollen eyes the whole time. Because I understood that for this to have been happening to me means that the Father himself had, under, had instructed through Christ his word the Holy Ghost in me as he is in you to make it known through me. And I didn't take that lightly. I knew the, the process of, of how this had to have taken place. Because they were mysteries never before known. Do you understand as this is saying this? Was, it was given to the teacher by God, right? Through the Holy Ghost, but was given by God. Do you understand why I was showing you and pointing to noon? Noon, the name Noon, which is the name for the father of Yeshua, Joshua. And Noon means never ending or never changing. Father God's name, another one of his names is Noon. And noon is the revelation of the bullseye of Taurus. Which is what we were pointed to for the revelation of 5014. <laughs> By who? By the knowledge of God. <laughs> How do we just not crumble into pieces? Knowing that it's from him. How do we contain it within our little peddly little vapor of a thought of mind? But God, right? But God. So the teacher is given knowledge by God to understand these prophets so he can, sorry, so he can likewise teach the people righteousness and prevent their destruction at the end of days. This passage reveal, reveals much about the community's theology of prophecy. The teacher was chosen long ago by God. Here it is. Here you are. You ready? The teacher was chosen long ago by God. Yeah, before the foundation of the earth. Remember that in the creation story, brothers and sisters, the Luke portion, gap theory, the verse one and two of, of the entire Bible. The teacher was chosen long ago by God to prepare the remnant for the end of days. That's you. This is us. The prophets were likewise, you see, this would seem like an absolutely absurd claim to make, wouldn't it? Who on earth has ever claimed to be this person? and this group of people being prepared. It would, it would be absurd to think that you could proclaim something like that. Do you know the only way that it could be proclaimed? Is if you were the actual one revealing the mysteries within the law and within the prophets. And we are. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm freaking out. The prophets were likewise sent generations ago to prepare for this event. You see that? 
the prophets were even prophesying not only the stuff of the is when Christ was coming, they were also prophesying the mysteries in the is to come, yet they didn't understand it. Listen to what it says. When the teacher interprets the law, he is more similar to the biblical prophets in his mode of revelation than a scribe or midrash rabbi. Unlike the rabbis, the teacher does not rely on the Pashat or Dedrash. You see, how many times have you heard me talk about, we don't need other books. We don't need the, even the Apocrypha books. What has happened with the Apocrypha books is we reveal stuff from the Gospels, from the Prophets, from the Psalms, even like even in the modern stuff, I mean, in the is stuff. You see, this is all was. They didn't even have the is yet. So they didn't even know that the teacher of righteousness in the final generation would not only have the revelation of the was from the prophets and the law, but he was also going to start with the revelation of the is and the gospels that would reveal the prophets and the law. Hello. But the, the apocrypha books, we do not go. I have never gone to the apocrypha books and then gone to scripture to try to prove them. It's been the revelation of scripture that has then brought us to apocrypha books where people studying them say, oh my goodness, look at what you were saying. Here it is. Kind of like this. The first group going to, the, going to heaven or the third heaven, the second group going to paradise, the third group inheriting the city. Pre, mid, post, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. See, whereas the rabbis, they use these things. The teacher does not. His interpretations are more than mere allegories of text. You see, even pastors, it, they're allegories of text. But at the same time, they are not visions. See this? How many times have you heard me say this over the years? I don't get dreams or visions. I get revelation of understanding. It says, but at the same time, they are not visions as the ancient prophets experienced them. Traditionally, the teacher, or sorry, additionally, the teacher is different from other exegetes because he does not merely apply scripture to his situation, but rather claims that scripture is written with him in mind based on the manner in which he interprets scripture. We can generalize that the teacher is similar to the prophets, but unique in his own right. You see? Not the same, not like the prophets, because they received dreams and visions. The teacher of righteousness receives the understanding of the mysteries hidden within them that not even the prophets knew. Awesome, awesome stuff, guys. Let's keep going. <clears throat> uh, where are we? Okay, not the temple scroll. The right. All right, let's go into the first and third paragraph of this one. Who is the teacher of righteousness? So we'll go into first and third paragraph in this one. Difficulties arise. So in relation to who, it, who is the teacher of righteousness? Well, not a mystery anymore. Difficulties arise when one tries to describe the teacher of righteousness. However, the complexity that most affects uh, the description deals with whether to place the figure in the past or in the future, you see? Because there was one that established the one community and there's a future one. So they've, there's been debates over the decades whether it's just a past one or it's a future one or whether it's both. Many point to the ambiguity of the Midrash of Numbers 21, 18 that is in the Damascus document. Unlike other passages in the same document, the figure mentioned here is in the future, the final generation. You see, this is why I've said this many uh, along the way a few times. He has to be the one in the future. This final generation happening here right now. Because if it was the one from the past, then the revelations would have already been made known. And for 2000 years, there would have been no mysteries in them. Here the confusion arises because the title and, sorry, because the titles, interpreter of the law and 
teacher of righteousness are interchangeable. The teacher must have a role both uh, in both the past and the future. He is a figure of the community's past as its founder and writer of its law. But the law he writes is pertinent to the end. Okay? For by following this law as divinely interpreted by the teacher, community members can bring about the end time. Hello. This dual nature of the teacher, however, should not be over-exaggerated. The teacher himself is in no way a messianic figure. He will not return. <coughs> he will not return at the end time. But he does anticipate, here it is, but he does anticipate the, re the arrival of his eschatological counterpart. You see, there is one from the past, and there's the one for the end of days happening right now, for the final generation. He is the anticipated eschatological counterpart who will bring about the revelations of those mysteries who God wrote it on his heart to receive. <laughs> it should also be made clear in the initial stages of this inquiry that the teacher of righteousness is not, okay? He is not John the Baptist. He is not Jesus Christ. And we cannot attribute a specific name to him. I was chuckling with my wife. I'm like, honey, what's his name? I think you could say it. <laughs> but the reader can paint a general portrait of the teacher based on the way the teacher interprets, see, the understanding. By the way he describes his experiences in the Hadot, that's the Psalms portion, he, it seems that he is a priest who writes divinely inspired inter interpretations of the law. He is a figure who in the, uh, um, he is a figure in the past who prepares his community for the eminent end. <coughs> you see, two of them. A was and the preparation for the end of days. <clears throat> Let's go to the next one. Let's scroll down. Let's scroll down. Let's go to the one, some of this on the priest. So let's go to the first and second paragraph. I don't know. I think I meant this and this. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I don't think we need that one. So we'll go in these two. The evidence clearly shows that the teacher of righteousness is a priest. This is explicit in textual evidence and suggested contextually based on the teacher of righteousness's concerns. For instance, the Pesher of Psalms 37, 23 through 24. The steps of the man are confirmed by the Lord. He delights in all his ways. Listen to this. Though he stumbles, he shall not fall, for the Lord shall support his hand. Whoa. <clears throat> Whoa. Interpreted, this concerns the priest, the teacher of righteousness, listen to this, whom God chose to stand before him, for he established him to build for himself the congregation of, <clears throat> right? This, this group. So let's see. Here the teacher is a priest who establishes, oh no, this is the one I wanted to, da, 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 to. Establish the community based on the will of God, a priest chosen by God. <clears throat> okay. Again, we're getting close to three hours. I don't want to go too, too much longer. Okay. And the priest, oh, not the high priest. That's, that's, you see, some of this, as you go through it, when he's talking about the, this other section here with high priest, some would say there's the attribute of high priest to him, but it's not true. Okay, the Messiah, that, that portion through the Messiah is the one as the high priest. It's the high priest Messiah, as you're going to see. It is the high priest Messiah coming, who is said to take it from the teacher of righteousness and complete the revelation of it. This is why I was telling you earlier I don't know if that means this is when the Lord takes it here because the Lord is the high priest Melchizedek king, right? <clears throat> but 
when he comes for 40 days, he's coming as prophet. He's not coming as high priest and King Melchizedek till he comes at the end of seals as one of the two witnesses, which is why I was also sharing the Zechariah when it's related to the portion of the two witnesses, which you're going to see as we continue on a little bit further. So now we see the portion as prophet. So it says, although the teacher does not share many of the traits of the ancient prophets uh, uh, that the ancient prophets hold in common, he is, largely, uh, he is clearly a prophet. His visions can be understood as a correct understanding or order of words through divine revelation of scripture. In this sense, the teacher sees more. On the most basic level, the teacher is unlike the prophets, uh, the other prophets, because he does not have visions that come in the form of dreams like scenes. <clears throat> he is not a seer with a third eye. However, a deeper understanding of the meaning of prophecy shows that the teacher is similar to biblical prophets. Otto Betts compares the teacher, uh, compares the teacher's divine revelation of scripture to Daniel's interpretation of dreams <coughs> and, complete, and concludes that the Pesher and Apocalypse are quite similar. Moreover, Betts notes that both the teacher and Daniel use the term Raz to help describe the mystery of their interpretations. A clear parallel can be seen when Daniel interprets the writing on the wall at Belshazzar's feast. At Belshazzar's feast. Here, only Daniel is able to interpret the writings of a supernatural author. Moreover, he dissects the inscription so as to give the interpretation based on each word similar to the teacher's manner of interpreting the prophets. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little coffee. Told you this is incredible. Late start from a family dinner. It's midnight. All right, come on, let's go. The teacher is similar to other prophets, both in manner of interpretation and the reasons behind his revelation. In the following passage, <clears throat> the teacher is similar to the prophets in a number of ways. The te and they, teachers of lies and seers of falsehood, see, the ones who are trying to come against, have schemed against me a devilish scheme to exchange the law engraved on my heart, that should be heart, to thee for the smooth things which they speak to thy people. And they withhold, here it is, and they withhold from the thirsty the drink of knowledge. Isn't that what we've been doing? <clears throat> Isn't this what you guys have been receiving that you've even expressed to me yourselves? I'm receiving it through the word. And assuage their thirst with vinegar. You see how many have even gone to their pastors and, and tried to talk to their pastors and their pastors are like, ah, oh, don't follow that stuff, that's crazy. But they wouldn't even take the time to see the introduction series that we talk about where we can lead people to ministryrevealed.com to this intro page and come to this 22 minute video to get a brief understanding of the revelation intro of the gospels, revelation of the intro of the 14 years and how it was all missed because of Matthew before going into the deeper depths of it all. You see, it's easier to assuage their thirst and just give a little vinegar and everybody be on your way. Like the staff, the teacher is indeed uh, uh, is needed by those thirsty for knowledge. In this passage, we also see that the teacher's righteousness is not fully human because the law is engraved in his heart by God. His interpretation of the law is divine interpretation. God has given the teacher the power to interpret all the words of his servants, the prophets, and then God feeds the teacher with his words by which to prophesy. Here, the relationship between God and the teacher is inextricably, inextricably close. Again, God is what? Noon. He gave us the revelation of noon. <clears throat> like the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the teacher, listen to this. The teacher cannot escape his righteousness despite the distress it causes him. Hello. Hallelujah. Moreover. The teacher is similar to other prophets 
in his impetus for making the interpretations. Like Amos, Ezekiel, and Daniel, the teacher writes at a time of serious social turmoil and attempts to solve the turmoil by urging a new world order. No, this isn't the new world order of, 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 uh, of, of uh, doom and gloom, right? This is an order being spoken about of bringing the revelation to the world, of trying to share it with everybody, because if everybody had understood these things, if we were able to get it out to the churches and to grow it and to grow it, it would be over. The revelation would be made known. But we also understand that it's never going to happen, that the end of the age must take place. <clears throat> you see? Otherwise, the entire harvest model has gone out the window. The entire harvest model doesn't work. Everybody coming in all at once and it's over. It's the 10% first fruits to the Lord. Then it's the great multitude, the, the main harvest. Then it's the corners and gleaning. That's pre, mid, and post. That's Luke, Mark, and Matthew. That's spirit, light, flesh. Craziness. When the question concerning the identity of the teacher of righteousness was initially asked, the following passage was used as an example. The nobles of the peoples, of those who come to dig the well of the staff, ordained to walk in the age of wickedness, nothing would be seen and tell them, okay. The end, okay, the end, the end of the age cannot take place until there is proper order in the society, till it all comes together, right? It's not until the entire revelation of the end comes to an end. When society in the world, when Jerusalem is brought back, when there's no more enemies coming against them, when the temple worship is there, when does all that come? At the end of the eschaton, the end of the end of days. But the end of the end of days cannot come until the revelation of the understanding revealed by the teacher of righteousness taken over by the Lord himself is fulfilled, then all of this will take place. The end of the age. <clears throat> now listen to this. But the teacher of righteousness does not take part in the end of days himself. See that? This is what got me wondering and thinking. As soon as I read that, my thoughts instantly went to Luke 24, 44. Because you see, what these people giving and, and breaking down the understanding of the teacher of righteousness from this, these ancient scrolls, they don't know what the, what the teacher of righteousness will know. You see? So to them, what does the end of days mean? <clears throat> does the end of days mean when the two witnesses come? Because like everybody else, they don't understand there's a first seven years. So when reading this, when it says that the teacher of righteousness won't take part in the end of days because his responsibility was to prepare, my first thought in reading it is because this is exactly what I've been preparing is the revelation of the end time understanding of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, as well as the New Testament of the things that must yet be fulfilled in Christ. And if this is the typology of Christ then coming during the 40 days, then Christ is the one taking it over from the teacher of righteousness to complete its fulfillment. <clears throat> this makes a lot of sense. But, as you see as they break it down, as I was saying earlier, they believe that the connection to when the Lord takes it over is connected to the time of the two witnesses. In which case, the teacher of righteousness is here till the end of the seals when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion and completes the work of the revelation of the teacher of righteousness. You'll see what I'm talking about. But you could definitely see, I'm sure, why I would think it's connected to the beginning. Because he then completes it. You see? <clears throat> he completes bringing about the revelation. And these guys don't know that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days at the beginning. 
So if he's not to take part in the end of days, it would make sense that then he's part of the pre-trib group going, having prepared a group <clears throat> in the community, and he's gone. And when the Lord comes after the wedding, he reveals the rest to them. You see? So the teacher of righteousness does not take part in the end of days himself. Instead, now it gets serious, he prepares the way. Uh-oh, I don't like that wording. <laughs> he prepares the way for the eschatological messiahs. Hello. We've talked about that, haven't we? For the eschatological messiahs. <clears throat> Why messiahs? Because messiahs doesn't mean just Jesus messiah. It means anointed one as well. Who do we know are coming in the end of days as the two anointed ones? Yeshua, Jesus, Joshua typology as high priest and king. And Zerubbabel the branch. When the council of peace is going to be between them both of which Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest and king, is the greater authority because he's the one directly connected to the Father. When do these guys show up? <laughs> At the end of the six years of seals. At the end of the six years of seals. So you see what I'm talking about <clears throat> in reading this? And it says the teacher of righteousness himself doesn't take part in the end of days. Do they really understand that he doesn't take part in the end of days? Or is it because they don't understand that there's two sets of seven years? Because they don't have the revelation of the teacher of righteousness. Because if him not taking part of the end of days is because he's the one that prepares the way for the eschatological two messiahs, then that's because these guys are thinking that the end of days begins with the two messiahs who are the two witnesses. We know that that doesn't happen till the end of the six years of seals, which then could very well mean the end of days that these guys are talking about and him preparing the way which bring it to the end of six years of seals has nothing to do with the actual beginning of the end of days. It would have to do with the end of the first six years of seals. Having prepared the way for the two witnesses, two messiahs, two anointed ones. Now you see what I'm saying? As, as much as Luke 24 looks really good for it, the connection <coughs> isn't to when just Messiah comes, but when Messiah and the two anointed or the, the Messiah who is an anointed one and the other anointed one comes. That wouldn't be till when he comes at the end of the first six years of seals. And would then mean that this teacher of righteousness is still also here when the Son of Man comes and completes the revelation upon him and the community. Crazy. He sets the standard for interpretation of Scripture. Listen to this. How crazy is this? This is what I was talking about earlier. He sets the standard for interpretation of scripture which the priestly messiah who takes the teacher's place in interpretation of the law relies on at the end of days uh, what <laughs> what who's the priestly messiah guys the high priest, Yeshua, Jesus. When he comes as Melchizedek, priest and king. He's going to be using the interpretation that the teacher had and take it forward from that to bring about and complete the rest of the revelation in the end of days. The last seven years. <laughs> Do you do you understand this could even be invented in a script? These are these are from writings 2,000 years ago talking about us, guys. <clears throat> Try to stick that in your brain and, and dissect that 
that you're a, you're a part of this. <laughs> Come, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> over the top. Over, over the top. What else? It's <clears throat> oh, a little bit more. So here it comes. The king is the congregation and the basis of the statutes of the books of the prophets who saying Israel despised. You see, they, they often despise the prophets because it's always like, quote unquote, a doom and gloom for their own disobedience that he's trying to wake them up. Right. The star is the interpreter, the interpreter of the law who shall come to Damascus as it is written. A star shall come forth out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise up out of Israel. The scepter is the prince of the whole congregation, and when he comes, he shall smite all the children of Seth. Well, when do these two guys come? The two witnesses come at the end of the six years of seals, when he's now going to what? It's, it's the story of Ezekiel, right? That Ezekiel 38, 39, right? The, the 39 war. He's now going to destroy all of them that come against, just like the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of the sixth year. You see, this is when they'll all be gathered together. It's talked about in Second Esdras as well. We've shared it many times. Here, two messiahs emerge at the end of days. You see that? Now, when you read this more closely, it seems like the, the, uh, uh, the teacher is actually here until the two witnesses. Because you see, it says the two messiahs emerge at the end of days. Well, no, they don't. They emerge halfway through the end of days because it hasn't been understood that there's a first seven years before the two witnesses come, you see? The whole world has missed that. Why? Because it was the teacher of righteousness that would make the revelation and the connection through the prophets and the law and the Psalms and the gospels. The interpreter of the law or the priest Messiah, okay, because why? The priest Messiah has now taken it over from the, from the uh, teacher of righteousness. <laughs> the Messiah is taking it over from the teacher of righteousness. <laughs> Unbelievable. And the prince of the whole congregation, the Davidic Messiah. Hello. These figures are also referred to through the DDS, that's the, I think through the Damascus documents, as the messiahs of Aaron and Israel. Hello. The messiahs of Aaron and Israel. Does that ring a bell? How about we go to the connection from the last video when we go into Hebrews chapter 7. What is Hebrews chapter 7? The end of the sixth seal? The, uh, the end of the sixth year of seals? And it's the seventh year of seals. The Lord is now there on heavenly Mount Zion. He, the Lord is now high priest and king. He is the Melchizedek. And he's the Melchizedek who's what? Who's what? Who is greater than the order of Aaron. You see? Because the order of Aaron wasn't good enough. It was for the slaughter of animals. <coughs> That's been done away with. So Melchizedek is the greater. This is when Messiah comes and fulfills that portion of being the true high priest and king. When he came the first time, like we said in the last video, going into Hebrews and breaking it all down in the is to come, we know in the is that, yes, Messiah quote unquote filled it, but in the spirit sense, within us, in the temple within. But there is a literal understanding of this revelation in the end of days and it starts at the end of the sixth year of seals which is the start of the seventh year of, uh, of seals when he comes as high priest and king as who after the order of aaron but the greater order which is that of melchizedek which is who yeshua joshua my goodness you see for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken 
pertaineth to another tribe. You see that? For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. It's kind of interesting, right? So it's this whole twist that you have to understand. Is, is he Judah, right? Who is, who is the Lord Messiah going to be? Is he going to be the high priest? Or is he going to be the Davidic Messiah one? We know that the Lord is the high priest Joshua. We know that he is. We've already shared it. We, we've shown it right there in the portion of the two witnesses in, in uh, Zechariah. Who is the Davidic one? Who's the one sitting on the throne there? Who's going to do that? Zerubbabel. It's Zerubbabel. Here, the Messiah Aaron takes precedence, precedence because he is the eschatological high priest who teaches righteousness at the end of days. Although the prince of the congregation presides over the battle liturgy and the eschatological banquet, the Messiah of Aaron. See, it's not really the Messiah of Aaron, right? We know it's the, the Messiah uh, uh, um, uh, High Priest Melchizedek is more important for understanding the teacher of righteousness. You see, the connection between the teacher of righteousness is connected not to the Davidic king one, Melchizedek, but to the actual Messiah high priest himself. Again, let me reiterate the importance of the revelation of Taurus. In the beginning, those words in the beginning at creation, it was Taurus. And in the beginning was the 16th day in the month of Taurus. What is the 16th day in the month of Taurus? Well, that would lead this to be the seventh Sabbath. And this would then begin the 50 days, which is what? The 16th day of Taurus. In the beginning, it was the 16th day of Taurus. There is a connection to the revelation as, <coughs> as noon and being this eye, which is the connection that the Father gave to ministry revealed by the Spirit with the connection to Aldebaran and the 5014, which is the name noon, which is the connection to the Father, perpetuity. All connected to Taurus, the beginning. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, revealing the teacher of righteousness. That it's the Father who wrote it on his heart. And when the Messiah, Aaron, or really the Messiah, Melchizedek, one of the two witnesses at the end of the six years of seals, is the one that completes after the preparation of the teacher of righteousness comes to an end? What the? Because he is the one who continues the teacher's message. The arrival of the Messiah's Aaron and Israel marks the eschatological turning point. Once they arrive, Messiah Aaron interprets the law, his legacy, in the community is the basic interpretation of the law that functions at the end of days. <clears throat> I won't even go into all the rest of it because you know what it goes into now? <clears throat> I'm just going to bring it to an end. But you know where it goes into. I'm going to go a little bit further. But it goes into this conversation of the Testament of Levi. And the Testament of Levi is, is one of the, the key points. <clears throat> Listen to this last line in the Testament of Levi. The two witnesses, one is a priest. Ta-da! And now, let's see the Testament of Judah. You see, one is the priestly line of Levi, and the other one is through Judah. But the priestly line through Levi has an apparent connection 
to being through Ephraim, just as Joshua was. You see, we got to remember, the Levitical line was divvied up over the 12 tribes, right? So you had four encampments of the tribes. And the one to the east, as I'm just remembering their divisions now, the one to the east, hello Taurus, the one to the east is the one that out of the divisions of the priestly lines at the heads of the four tribes, and we know the, the Levitical line was in between, they were given no lands and so forth, right? They were among the four tribes, but they had their four divisions among the four tribes of each of which had their, their, their three or four, right? Or I guess their three. And what happened is the one of line of Aaron and Moses was the Eastern. You see? It was the Eastern. You have one of the two witnesses being the priest Levi line connected to that Ephraim portion, but through the Levitical line. And now it gets into what? The Messiah Ben Joseph and Messiah Ben David. This is what takes us back to exactly what we were talking about of the two messiahs the two witnesses we have said this many times the reason the jews never recognized messiah right that the vast majority are blinded to it is one for our benefit but two is because it wasn't fulfilled yet how could he fulfill the destroying of the enemies of those who came against Jerusalem to destroy it and destroyed the temple when the temple was still there and they were living there. They're looking for a Messiah who returns and destroys the enemies who have destroyed them in their temple. Well, even though the temple's not there, what are they looking for? <clears throat> the one that came and destroyed and came against them, that destroyed Jerusalem and scattered them. When he does this, what's going to happen? When he's coming, they're going to come to gather against him, to attack and to destroy him, as we see at the end of the sixth year of seals, as we see in, in uh, 2 Ezra 13. It's the exact same story. They're going to come against to destroy. It is the Ezekiel 39 war. And then what are they expecting? Then the third temple will be rebuilt. Exactly. Exactly. At the end of six years of seals, Messiah, you see, Messiah ben Joseph, the priestly line <coughs> through Ephraim and the Le Levitical line with Aaron, as this time Melchizedek. And then you've got the branch. The branch is the other line. You see, the two witnesses, the, the two that went to spy out were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was Ephraim through Joseph. And, and uh, Caleb was Judah. Their typologies are the Messiah ben Joseph and the Messiah ben David, the Davidic line who is going to be the modern day Zerubbabel who lays the foundation during seals and what? Rebuilds the temple. You see, Messiah Jesus, when he comes as high priest, he's not rebuilding the temple. He's the high priest and he's the one in direct communication with the Father. And what is he doing? He's leading the 144,000 at that point. He's taking, taking it forward from there, from the teacher of righteousness, to complete the rest of the story. And the branch, the Davidic line, is the branch who's going to rebuild the temple. This is what the Jews are waiting for. They're waiting for the Messiah, Jesus, to come and destroy the enemies that come against them and for the branch to come in and rebuild the temple. These are things we've taught on. <clears throat> These are things we've taught on. It is so 
awesome. And let me finish with this that is going to bring us back to, oops, where are we? That's going to bring us back to these two witnesses and the book of Hebrews, which is why this is a, a, a perfect bring back, take back to the last video, how the Lord led this for this time. You see, the two witnesses will come to fulfill these two portions of kingship and priesthood. And remember, it'll be between them both. Listen to this. And they and the will be the testators, and they will be the testators of the testament of the Levitical priesthood and the Davidic kinship. Listen to this. In order to be the testator of a testament, you have to die. Isn't that exactly what we read <clears throat> in Hebrews, right? To, to have a, a, a New Testament, a, new, a covenant being established, which happens at the beginning of seals, like we taught in the last video, there has to be what? There has to be a shedding of blood. <clears throat> and in Hebrews 9.16, it says, and where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. What is he saying here? That the two witnesses being the kingship and priesthood, that they are the testators and they're the ones that must die to complete the testament. Who's the main one that must die? Messiah. Messiah high priest, even though they will both die. And it's Messiah High Priest that comes. This is why when we shared in the last video and in others, you see it right here. In Hebrews 6, we know why the Son of Man must die. Yes, it is for a covenant. But when he makes that covenant, it is the time of what? The Levitical priestly line of Aaron who caused the second strike on the rock with Moses. There is going to be a fall of some or one at least within this priestly Levitic line during the time of trumpets, who will have been partakers and tasted of the Holy Ghost and the many gifts and tasted of the powers of the world to come. If they fall, and they can't stay fallen because they've been sealed with the Father's name, that means for the Lord to renew them again, he must be re-crucified afresh. You see, he must be re-crucified. What is the story from the entire revelation of the teacher of righteousness and the revelation of it all? Every single part and piece of the revelation that has been happening here is the story of the teacher of righteousness and a group of those who are drinking of the revelation, seeking it and searching it, understanding it, being prepared for the end of days brothers and sisters it's a long one i pray it bless you i pray it has fired you up i pray it has given you the understanding of the revelation that has taken place that the lord has lifted the weight off of me that i can freely move i can sleep i can rest at peace because just like habakkuk my cry has been heard, and the time is at hand. Brothers and sisters, help us. Help us help Uganda and our brothers and sisters there. Help us do as much as we can in these final moments, wherever we can. Because once it begins, there will be no more. It'll all be sold. And we will be servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the revelation of his is to come, being revealed and understood fully, going throughout the earth, living in the wilderness, living in people's houses, being prepared for us in them, and preaching and teaching from house to house within them. 
So help us get the revelation out to as many as we can now before it all begins. Because we are now in Taurus Savant. I love you, brothers and sisters. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.